Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming tonight to the Spring Homeowners Association Leadership Forum. We're glad you could make it. Um, just a couple of rules tonight for tonight. Um, we have a lot of speakers and they're covering a wide range of topics. I'm just gonna ask if everyone can hold their questions until the end of each speaker's presentation. Um, at that point in time, we will have a microphone that you can ask your question into. We are taping this for those people that could not make it, so it'll be, it'll be televised later. Um, also, if you have any specific questions that are just for your subdivision in your neighborhood, please hold them until the very end and you can ask whichever presenter you need to ask that question to individually. So to get started, I'd like to welcome our mayor. Brian Barnett has served as Rochester Hills mayor for 16 years and is the longest serving mayor in the history of the city. During his tenure, Rochester Hills has been recognized as one of the top places to live in America, numerous times by sources like CNN and Money Magazine. In addition, Rochester Hills has held the title as safest city in Michigan for the past five years. Mayor Barnett's vision for Rochester Hills is to be the preeminent place in America to live, work, and raise a family. Let's welcome Mayor Barnett. Thanks, Jody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. And you guys all volunteer in your neighborhoods. I know you've got a little more energy than that. Nice to see everyone this evening. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to uh, Jody and the many, many team members here who have organized tonight. This night is not for us, it's for you. We've lined up hopefully some interesting speakers and topics uh, to make sure that we're able to assist you. Uh, we appreciate what you do. We appreciate the roles that you have in uh, representing your community, your intimate community, your neighborhood in many instances. And it's a role that we, it's difficult for us to play with so many neighborhood associations. But a night like tonight is designed to uh, make sure that we put the right people in front of you, talk about some of the things that we see happening in the city, give you some information, arm you with some data that hopefully will help uh, spread the word uh, into the neighborhood streets. And like I said, we are grateful for each and every one of you. How many of you, this is your first uh, homeowners Association meeting. All right, good. Well, welcome. The rest of you are crafty veterans. Is that what I'm to assume? Excellent. Well, we have some new faces. I want to make sure I recognize those or, or, or introduce those to you. One of them is Jody. You might remember Bob White, who uh, used to lead uh, this. Uh, Bob White has... Uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this uh, great retirement that's happening across the country, but it certainly is happening here in the city of Rochester Hills as well. Uh, Bob retired, uh, and Jody, uh, with us now for a little under a year, is doing a fantastic job and uh, will be leading us uh, today. Uh, she has a new uh, boss, um, our director of building uh, ordinance uh, and facilities. You might remember Scott Cope. Uh, he retired last month, and our new director is Mike Bizanko sitting over here. So. Welcome, Mike. And although he's not here, I don't see him here today. Uh, another significant person and department that you often deal with uh, with your neighborhoods is uh, the, the Department of Public Services. Uh, Alan Schneck has been the director of the Department of Services, Public Services for the last 11 years, and he's retiring at the end of this month. Uh, and we're in the process of interviewing to replace uh, Alan Schneck. So some significant folks uh, that are retiring, and uh, uh, obviously we've got some great people. Uh, the city of Rochester Hills is a desirable place to work among our colleague communities, and so we tend to get a great group of people to interview and to uh, to choose from. So we welcome Mike and uh, and again uh, uh, Jody and and whoever will be Alan's new replacement. And since I'm mentioning this, the person that's responsible for all of those hirings uh, is in the back. That's Chelsea uh, Ditz. You'll hear from her in just a minute. She's the director of HR, and she's only been with us for about a year and a half. So Chelsea, let's give Chelsea a round of applause and her team, Celeste and others. Speaking of teams, I always like to recognize ours. We are blessed in the city, and if you don't believe me, uh, Google uh, the city of Rochester Hills and look at the last hundred articles that appear about us. You'll see almost all positive things in our community, and that's not true uh, in most communities, even those communities around us that look like us. Uh, and that is, in large measure, we have a wonderful working relationship with our city council, the administration and council. We have several council members here today. I'd like to recognize them. Our president, Ryan Deal, is here. Ryan's in the back. There's Ryan. Round of applause. Our Vice President, Dr. Susan Boyer, is in the back there. There's Dr. Boyer. And David Walker, one of our other council members in the back as well. 
Always with a smile and a wave, Dave Walker. Well, listen, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, share a few things with you, and I'm going to try and uh, multitask, and I don't do this very well, uh, running my own media, which is challenging. But uh, let me start first. The most important thing, if you never remember nothing else, uh, know that my sole and singular purpose outside of supporting our team here tonight is just to say thanks. Um, it is really tough. Uh, to volunteer in a position like you're doing. I know, uh, I've done it. Uh, it's sort of thankless. You get the calls that someone's basketball hoop is up and someone's lawn hasn't been mowed and the gutter looks bad down the street and the, someone rolled over the flowers in the commons area. Not often do you get, hey, you're doing a great job. Uh, but we appreciate the work that you do. And again, as I said before, uh, know that our job here is to stand alongside you, whether it's with the Sheriff's Department, the Fire Department, the Ordinance Department, the Department of Public Services, or the Mayor's Office, to make sure that our resources are at your disposal uh, to help you do your job as well as possible. Uh, I do want to take a chance just to share with you some positive things about the city in hopes uh, that you'll remember some of these things and share these things uh, often, either with your neighbors, on your Facebook page, uh, at uh, whatever clubs uh, you're involved in, because our city has done really well. And like most of you in your business life and family and personal life have been challenged, the last two years have not been easy for cities as well. And at the height of the pandemic, we turned our organization inside out, changed everything we were doing. And we became a call center. We called every senior citizen in this city over the age of 70 every week to create a relationship with them, to help them get prescription drugs, to help them get toilet paper, to make sure that they knew that they mattered to us. And it was firefighters, it was receptionists, it was the mayor, it was department directors, it was every single person making hours and hours of calls each week to make sure that our residents knew that we cared. And that's what mattered. It didn't matter so much that uh, things were happening out there because you weren't driving on our roads as much as you were or visiting our, well, you were visiting our parks, but we focused on our people. And we've continued to do that with lessons we've learned throughout the pandemic. And now that we seem sort of, sort of I don't know if you're like you, but until they took the, the face masks off the airplanes, it didn't quite feel like the pandemic was over. Maybe now, uh, officially, it feels a little bit more like that. Um, but we can now look with a little bit of a rearview mirror at some of the things we've been able to accomplish. And when we went into the pandemic, two things that I think are interesting. We had a vacancy rate in our uh, business community. I think like how many businesses did the city lose through the pandemic? Because it was a really challenging time. And we look at three things. We look at these different numbers across industrial, retail, and commercial properties, combine them into one, and that gives us a vacancy rate. And our vacancy rate, which means the number of businesses that our city has at the end of the pandemic is actually greater than the number we had going into the pandemic. We increased uh, in terms of the businesses open in the business community in our city. And the other number that we look at uh, was the unemployment number. The unemployment number was actually higher going into the pandemic than it is now. Two strong economic indicators that show the strength of the city uh, in, in very measurable ways. Really, really proud of those. But the vacancy rate, I think, now is about 4%, and the unemployment rate is about 2.6, I think, at our latest number. Well below the national average of 3.6. Of course, the problem in our community is finding people, right? Arby's is hiring for $16 or $17 an hour because we can't find the people. So the business community and the residents that support that business community have been very, very strong, and that's been really, really important. And I would say now that as we kind of look back, uh, what the city council and the administration did was that we really chose to invest in our community. We took the time to look at what was important to us, and much like calling our residents and making sure they were okay, we recognized that creating space and creating unique identities for the city was important which is why one of the two projects that we really spent a lot of time in, and I hope you've had a chance to visit both of these, one of them is the Auburn Road Corridor. How many of you have been in the Auburn Road Corridor in the last 12 months? Is it better? <laughs> this is a huge win for the city. Uh, this is a project that is a, uh, a lifetime in the making. Three or four iterations of this over the last three decades really didn't amount to much until uh, we really started working on this and getting partnerships and strong leadership here to support it. And that's what it used to look like. You all remember that. You could walk out the door of one business from pavement all the way across the, into the door on the other side of the road on pavement, never stepping on anything. Uh, this is what it looks like now. It's much more user friendly. Uh, it has uh, a, a tremendous amount of new amenities with the city's first splash pad, uh, with the roundabouts that uh, obviously this last year we decorated for the holiday season for the first time. Much safer. You actually can go down there at night and see people walking kids in strollers, families on bikes, uh, enjoying the Auburn Road corridor. As you know, we had a huge and very successful art 
program. Uh, art is a huge part of uh, this Auburn Road story uh, and uh, a lot of different uh, unique pieces down there. The city's first splash pad, not in one of the wealthier areas in the northern part of our community, but right in the heart of the city's first neighborhood and oldest neighborhood, Brooklyn's, back in 1929, it got to start. Uh, and this is a wildly popular place, so if you haven't taken your kids or grandkids here, this is free, uh, and we're actually looking at making it even cooler and uh, uh, more unique uh, this summer. Uh, so really cool, exciting place to, uh, to take folks to. As I mentioned, those businesses, those businesses, this is one of the business owners in our community that chose to open up in the middle of pandemic, uh, have been wildly uh, successful. The biggest business we opened up recently uh, was the Von Mar that opened up about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that, of course, in the old uh, Parisians and Carson spot, 122 thousand square feet. That's Mr. Von Maher. I asked him when he opened his first business. He said, my grandpa opened our first Von Maher in 1874 in uh, Waterloo, Iowa. And I almost felt like he was there for it. I can't verify it, but felt like he may have been there for it. I'm not sure. Uh, but a wonderful family, a beautiful building, a beautiful facility. And of course, we're very, very proud of the village of Rochester Hills. And that's one of the things, if you think about it, uh, malls aren't doing well right now. Partridge Creek has gone bankrupt. You see Oakland Mall has been sold. There's lots of issues across the place. Our uh, Outdoor Life Center uh, is doing really well. It's attracting new uh, uh, national uh, uh, retailers, and uh, a lot of that is on the strength of the disposable income on our community, the people that are supporting it, but again, hopefully creating a business environment that is conducive to, uh, uh, to new businesses getting a start. Um, the other thing we really tried to do is invest in our parks. Now, how many of you know where this is? This is actually one of the quietest, hottest places in the city right now. Uh, this is our new pickleball courts. We transformed some of the, the uh, uh, tennis courts out at uh, Borden Park, and I promise you right now that uh, maybe next to Starbucks, this is about the busiest place to find people in our city. Uh, they are lined up to play pickleball all hours of the day. In fact, right now we're looking at putting uh, lights up uh, on the court to, to get even more play uh, even later into the, uh, into the evening. But if you haven't been out there, of course, this is another free uh, thing that we have in the city, but pickleball is wildly popular, uh, and we had been uh, overwhelmed with people saying we need more courts, and uh, thankfully uh, the, the council supported, the parks department delivered, and we have six new courts for folks to enjoy uh, out at Borden Park. Um, uh, uh, our other pride and joy, of course, is Innovation Hills. Show of hands, how many of you have been out to Innovation Hills? Oh my goodness, that's fan that's fantastic, it's about 100%. And do you like it? Oh, that's fantastic. Appreciate you saying that. That's been a labor of love, and, and this is something, again, that we're really proud of. It's been wildly successful. You open something like this, and you hope that the, you know, you hope to have no problems, but if you're gonna have one, you hope that it's parking, uh, and it certainly is here with this. That's uh, wildly popular, and we have to park across the street. Uh, we're always looking at that and trying to make sure that everyone's experience is as safe and enjoyable as possible, but uh, this has just become uh, a, a wonderful success story and really one of the coolest new places to, uh, to, to come out and take a look. And whether you're a kid and you love this sort of crazy stuff, uh, or you like the new boardwalk loops that we put in and getting a chance to kind of reconnect with nature, and uh, we just got a grant uh, for a, uh, a rope bridge that's gonna take you to the other side of the park, which is a, 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 um, a green space parcel, which will just put some trails in. Uh, it'll extend the beautiful nature walks that we have in this area. And this is truly a regional park uh, um, and something that, again, that the city doubled down and invested in. We didn't shrink back uh, when COVID came. Uh, we doubled down and invested in some of the things we knew people would enjoy. And our parks usage, by the way, the first month of the pandemic, 300%. I knew where y'all were uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, it was pretty easy to find you. You were in our parks, and that love of the parks continued, uh, whether it's the Clinton River and uh, Paint Creek Trail or Borden or Bloomer or Innovation Hills. Uh, uh, park attendance is up about 30% year over year the last two years. We're always well over. Are you ready for this number? 1.1 million visitor days, visitor guests into our park every year. Hard to believe that the Rochester Hills Park System supports over a million visitors a year, but we do, uh, and we credit that to a, a really great team. Let me share with you one other thing that you might find interesting, and this is a good story, although it's not nearly as uh, exciting as uh, Innovation Hills or Auburn Road. Uh, how many of you experienced uh, outage problems in your neighborhood over the last several years? About as many of you that visited Innovation Hills. I wish the number was lower, it's not. We heard you, the council heard you, um, and they challenged and charged us with trying to do something about it, and so we really uh, ratcheted up uh, our, um, our work with DTE. And uh, I put together a couple committees and wouldn't stop until we got high enough on the chain to really connect and make some noise. 
And first we want to understand the problem. So they sat down with me over a number of Zoom meetings and our team, Tom Talbert, who also is retired from my office, uh, really led that effort. And uh, maybe it's me, is it me? <laughs> it's possibly me. Um, it really led that effort, and we found out that there were a tremendous amount of outages in the city. Many of you were losing power 13 to 20 times a year, not weather related. Everybody understands when there's a, a storm and you lose power. We get that, you know, that, that happens. But, you know, when it's a day like this and all of a sudden you lose power three or four times, it's really frustrating. Uh, and so we, uh, we ch challenged them to understand the problem, come back to us with a solution. And we were relentless, relentless. Tom called three times a week for months until we got responses. And uh, ultimately they came out, they put a plan together. This picture was taken last week. Uh, I met on site with about 30 people. How many of you have seen the DTE trucks in the, in the city over the last three months? Well, they have uh, descended on our city. Listen to this number. They have over 100 people a day cutting trees and lines in the city every day in the city since February 1. 100 people a day. And they hope to be done by June 1st. They're massively clearing the lines. 70% of outages are due to trees and limbs falling on lines. Uh, they think they'll have a significant, about a 70 to 80% improvement. Uh, they're investing about two to three million dollars, not just in tree trimming, but in other investments into the infrastructure here. We got DTE's attention, and believe it or not, for utility, they listened. And they're actually putting their money where your mouth, their mouth is. And the hands that just raised about how many of you have seen them, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's not always great. No one loves to have their trees trimmed and nubbed and stubbed. And, and they don't always look as great when they leave as when they started. But the idea uh, is, uh, is that we're finding uh, and, and challenging them to make a, uh, a real difference here. And hopefully this will uh, significantly impact the number of outages that we've had in the community. And uh, we're really grateful for them. And, and continue, want to you know, continue to hear from you on, uh, on what you're seeing and hearing and hopefully this problem will get better. doesn't mean there won't be outages in the future, um, but they aren't doing this in any other community. Uh, so don't tell your friends that live other places. Let's let them get done here. Then we don't care where they go after here. Um, but sort of selfishly, we wanted to make sure we, uh, we got some results for our residents. Uh, just quickly, um, city's in great financial shape. Uh, we have an incredible budget team. If you want to take the long way out the door, before you get to the exit, make a hard left. You'll see about every award you could possibly win. I see our team is like the Taylor Swift of, uh, of budget teams. They've won every award you can possibly win. Uh, we're in great financial shape coming through COVID uh, and stand in a really strong position moving forward. Uh, we've been recognized with just about every award a city can possibly win, uh, and I don't want to take all your time to do it, but I hope that through all this, there's a certain amount of city pride, not invested completely and totally in the mayor or the city council, but in uh, homeowner leaderships like yourself that say, hey, listen, we live in a great community. Yeah, maybe the grass is a little, you know, a little bit long on, on 123 Longford Street or whatever it might be, but doggone it, we're the safest city in Michigan. We have a top 10 fire department. We have some of the best parks in the region. Uh, hopefully you have a, 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 a government, both in the council and the administration, that is listening wants to hear from you, and hopefully uh, our goal is that you love living in the city of Rochester. So that's what I hope. I hope that you're proud of your, uh, your choice to live here and that uh, uh, you're raising uh, uh, family members, kids and grandkids that want to live here too. Uh, one last thing I'll share with you. Uh, I guess two. I forgot about this one. If you want more information about the city, um, I do a podcast uh, two or three times a month. Um, I'm not going to ask how many people watch the podcast because I've seen the numbers and not too many hands would go up here. Um, now it's getting better every month. We have uh, a few thousand folks that listen every time, so we appreciate that. But uh, we interview inc incredible people. My last uh, uh, podcast last week was on the, uh, the city's oldest continuous business. Anybody want to take a guess on what it was? Oldest business in the city. Anybody? What is it? Rochester Elevator, that's downtown Rochester. In our community, thinking Avon Township back in the day. I don't think so. We might beat that one. As soon as I say it, you're going to go, oh, cider mill. You ate cider mill. Started, uh, not making cider, but started as a mill back when Abraham Lincoln was president, the year that he gave the Gettysburg Address it opened. So it's, uh, it's been kicking around for a long time. So we interviewed their, uh, their leadership and uh, uh, really the sixth generation in the cider mill business, very unique. And we've interviewed all sorts of people, all with a connection to Rochester Hills. So if you love podcasts, I'd love you, love, to, love you to listen. The last thing I'll tell you, and then I'll answer a couple of questions. Um, a little bit of homework for you. Uh, every year we have this tremendous program called the Green Schools Program. How many of you have the green garbage bins that you take to the end of your road every day? Raise your hands. You can help us. If your hand's up, you can help us. Uh, there's a little chip on the end of that garbage can. You might not even know it. You get points every time you recycle. Recycle points go to your email. You, if you haven't ever used this, if this seems confusing to you, you're probably sitting on 30,000 points. Uh, all you have to do is log in. If you have any problems, you can contact my office. We're happy to help you through it. You log in uh, to your Recycle Bank account, and you click on Green Schools Program, and you can donate them to our school systems. Over the last 10 years, 
all of you have donated, this is an amazing number, almost $120,000 of real hard cash back to our schools for green programs that the students in these schools come up with just simply because you're doing the right thing in recycling. It's a wonderful story. We're the only community in Michigan that does it. We're always number one in the nation in terms of uh, uh, recycle bank, uh, in terms of recycling, in terms of donating points. So put it in your bulletins. Let people know. The interesting thing about this is it stops uh, May 4th. So only about two more weeks. A couple of schools have already got it. But if uh, if you uh, log on, you have a favorite school, you just want to donate your points. We could turn uh, the points you have in your email account into real dollars for the Rochester Community School Systems, and we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, let me stop here uh, and uh, just see if there's any questions for me before we turn it back over to Jody for the rest of the program. Yes? Uh, is there a long-term solution for parking at Innovation Hills? Um, we, uh, on that side of the street, it's very challenging. We're, we're fairly landlocked. Uh, you see the development that's happening. There's a, uh, it's the property there, there's got some constraints to it that we can't put some things over parts of that property. Uh, we are looking at a long-term permanent arrangement uh, with the folks across the street that could involve, you know, who, who knows. If I can find some money and get some grants, we might find something permanent over the street. If not, we might continue to try to make it safer for crossings. But um, it's a problem. I'm, I'm so glad that's the problem as opposed to going, where are all the people? Um, <laughs> And having to explain to council why nobody comes to our park, but uh, we're working on it, and I hope that uh, I hope that we'll be able to continue to keep some things open in the future. Good question, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Jody. Let me just say thank you. Uh, thanks for the privilege of uh, of continuing to serve uh, this community. Um, I'm, I'm easy to reach by email or by phone. Call me if I can help in any way. If you've got uh, uh, the building is sort of back open again. So um, for those of you that used to have meetings here, we were closed for a very long time. We had some challenges with that. But uh, if we can help you there, let us know. And uh, if there's anything else we can do, like I said, our job is to assist you. So thank you for being a great part of our community, and God bless. Take care. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. So next up, we have Human Resources, and Chelsea Diss is gonna come up and talk to us about our summer staffing. Thank you so much, Jody, and thank you, Mayor, and everyone who's here. We just wanted to make sure you're aware, as the Mayor mentioned, our parks are a fantastic resource we have in the, here in the city, and we're hiring for our seasonal staff to staff those parks. Celeste um, is our recruiter for that, so I'm gonna have her kick it off with some information. Hello everyone, as Chelsea mentioned, my name is Celeste Mansour. I'm the HR coordinator here at the City of Rochester Hills. I myself am fairly new, I've only been here a few months, so this is a new thing for me to learn the whole process of seasonal recruiting. Mayor did a great job um, showcasing all the new things that we have going on in our parks, and as you can imagine, with all that new stuff, we need new people to help run it. Um, so we're currently hiring for groundskeepers, lifeguards, and park attendants. Um, and, you know, any chances that you have to send this out to people within your homeowners association or if you know anyone that is interested or would like to apply, uh, please have them visit uh, rochesterhills.org slash jobs or there's these beautiful flyers that we have at the mayor's office that created for us that are um, out front and maybe in the packets that you might have already received. Uh, there's a QR code that you can scan and go ahead and read more about the jobs and see if there's anything that could fit someone that you know and pass it along to anyone that might be interested. My business card is also out on that front table. I open up my contact information for anyone to go ahead and ask any questions you might have, pass it on to anyone that might be interested. We're more than happy to help. Um, and the HR office is always open as well, so feel free to pass that along. And hopefully we can get some more people in to help run our parks like Innovation Hills, Bloomer, um, Spencer, and uh, Borden. Borden, <laughs> where we have those beautiful pickleball courts. So um, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Yeah, and just so you know, this is a great opportunity for for first time jobs, but also for summer jobs, for folks coming home from college potentially, or for someone who's retired and looking for an opportunity to give back to the community in another way and engage. And um, typically our su summer um, seasonal workers work about three to four summers and they have opportunities for management type jobs, supervisory type jobs, so it's a really great opportunity for them to grow when they're young as well, so. We've so it depends on the position. Um, park attendants start at 12.50 an hour. Lifeguards start at 14.50 an hour and so do groundskeepers. There are different age requirements, so please just keep that in mind and read the job postings to see what um, you could qualify for or the person you're referring could qualify for. Um, 
but overall there's pr there's step progression so as you return year after year there's step pay increases built into it as well and as Chelsea mentioned there is leadership opportunities so you know if you're doing great season after season you can move up to a ranger assistant ranger position which pays significantly higher um, so yeah there's there's quite a few opportunities I will tell you from my own experience again I've only been here a few short months but um, I've been working on an article in our lovely Hills Herald, which should be coming up in the next few months. And I had the chance to interview a lot of our current seasonal employees as well as um, our full-time staff that started off as seasonal employees. And it's been pretty consistent that everyone overall has had remarkably positive experiences and had a lot of great takeaways from what they've learned, even if they just stayed for a season. Um, so again, if you're, you know anyone that's interested, um, you know, feel free to refer them because it's a great opportunity, a great way to make connections and have a lot of developmental growth. And on May, oh, yeah. Um, so 16 is the general minimum age requirement for lifeguards and park attendants. We do have some positions available for 15 year olds who are turning 16 during the summer as beachfront attendants. And they, we also provide reimbursement for, um, for training, CPR training as well. So we provide training and opportunities there. We're also having an open house um, on May 1st at Spencer Park for folks who are interested. We're doing social media campaigns, so getting that opportunity out for them as well. And if you're interested in getting more information, I can share um, any of our flyers or any of our information about that job fair Chelsea just mentioned. You can just email me. Again, my business card's out there, and I can send you anything uh, that you would like to have as reference. So we hire approximately 60 positions generally. Obviously, Innovation Hills in the playground opening last year, that brings more, more customers, so to speak, and even just COVID. So um, we have about 35 to 40 returning. So it's new positions that we're still hiring for, and we like to even have more. We'd rather have more folks than less, so. Are there any other questions that we could answer while we're up here? Well, thank you so much for your time. Again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. It's an open invitation. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you Chelsea and Celeste. Next up, we have the Roger Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce President, Maggie Bobbitt. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Bobbitts, and I am the president of the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce. But being in front of you guys tonight, my more important role, I happen to be a resident too. So um, I take great pride, and I'm really excited that you guys have me here um, for the spring and fall. I'm glad to be back in person. So um, we will get started. So the Rochester Regional Chamber of Commerce has a mission. It's to provide leadership and resources in order to advance business development in partnership with civic, cultural, and educational interests for the benefit of its members and the community. Um, we work really hard there at the chamber to balance both of those. We actually, um, the chamber, um, portion of it deals with more of the business aspect of it, but we also have a community arm, which is our foundation. So I'm sure probably a lot of you are questioning, how does the chamber benefit the city of Rochester Hills community? Um, we do that in a multitude of ways. So we give referrals. So if you are looking for an electrician or lawn service, or you know the best place to get Chinese food. Um, call the chamber. Um, I have a staff of four, um, and they're very knowledgeable. We also have what we call um, our business directory, which will um, is on our website. So um, you can go there and punch in uh, you know a keyword, and it'll pull up all our members. Um, we do ask one thing, that when you do use one of our members, that you let them know that you were referred from the chamber. Um, it's just good PR for us. So one of the many things that we do do with um, the community is we provide welcome bags. So we provide welcome bags to the realtors in the area, the, and we've built a really good relationship with the Homeowners Association. So these are our brand 
um, and they're sponsored. Um, we don't, we have changed the way we do things with our welcome bags. You guys get a map in there. There's um, a map of the parks in there. Um, and we ask all our members to put something in the bag, but we have uh, asked our members not to put any paper in anymore. So we've asked them each to, um, I call them tchotchkes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the last time we sent out uh, a call for people to bring in stuff to pack the welcome bags um, last fall, um, we got some really neat things. We got, uh, we got a flashlight. Um, Auburn Animal Hospital brought us a dog bone with the, the plastic bag. So when you take your dog out, we got a tape measure, a Tide pen. So it is really a good way to get to know your your fellow residents, especially being the president in leadership in your homeowners association. I have to tell you, the star of this is Mr. Gary Bida. He happens to be one of my best good friends too, but he called me one day and he's like, Maggie, I need some welcome bags. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, I need 50 of them. And I'm like, 50? And he took those to all his new residents after the pandemic. And you would have never guessed, I mean, people would call the office and they were thanking us. And um, that's my good news story with the welcome bags. Um, we want you guys to utilize them. It's a great way to welcome people into the neighborhoods. They feel welcomed by the business and they're actually utilizing what is in the bags now. So we also do many community events. We have a community calendar on our website. <clears throat> You'll notice that members, nonprofits, um, the mayor's office sends us all sorts of stuff. Rochester Hills Museum, <coughs> excuse me, um, posted 70 new events yesterday. So it's a great way to get, find out what's going on in the community is the community calendar. <clears throat> so next up on the Chamber Foundations list is we, we will be executing and revitalizing the Memorial Day Parade. It will be the Memorial Day Parade of Heroes. It will be Monday, Memorial Day, May 30th. Um, it will run from Adams and Ticken to Adams and Silver Bell. Um, we're asking that whether you're a spectator or a participant, that you bring a picture of someone that you've lost, you know, over the years that you would like to honor. Um, anyone can participate. So we're looking for Girl Scout troops, you know, even if you want to get, you know, your, some of your fellow residents, you know, you want to march as a, you know, uh, one of the homeowners associations, let us know. Um, there, there's a bunch of information on the table back there. There's a participation form, but we also have a flyer for um, the, all the events that are going on Memorial Day in the communities. Um, the city of Rochester will do uh, a flag ceremony at um, the cemetery in Rochester. Mayor Barnett will do a ceremony at Veterans Point at Avon and Livernois. We will do the parade and then we close out the parade at the Veterans Tribute with a closing ceremony. So we wanted to make it a whole community event. And this was brought to us from the Sister City Committee. So the Sister City Committee, which is Rochester and Rochester Hills, they have council member from each of the municipalities came to me and said, Maggie, we'd like to um, reinvent this. We'd like to do it and make it sustainable so that it's done all the, every year. And they came to me because I also happen to be the director of the largest Christmas parade in the state of Michigan, which is the Rochester area hometown Christmas parade. And we'd like you to save the date of Sunday, December 4th for that parade. Um, we'll be marching down Main Street, no matter what this year, we're gonna get down there. So, um, but all my information is back on the table. Um, if you guys have any questions or, you know, about what we do or how we can help you, um, our doors are always open. We, uh, we answer the phones from nine to four. Um, and literally, if we don't know the answer to one of your questions, we will find out who can. All right, well, thank you. I'll see you guys in the fall.
Thank you, Maggie. Up next, we have Clinton River Watershed, Kaylee Snotty. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kaylee Snotty. I'm the Director of Education and Stewardship with the Clinton River Watershed Council. And um, we're a local nonprofit that's dedicated to protecting, enhancing, and celebrating the Clinton River, its watershed, and Lake St. Clair. So today I'm going to be sharing some um, maintenance tips, some best management practices for the detention ponds, the detention basins that some of you have in your neighborhoods. So stormwater detention basins are a best management practice that is designed to protect water quality and lessen the impact of development. So they are designed to collect stormwater from a designated area, in this case from neighborhoods, and they help to slow down the flow of stormwater to keep it from entering our rivers and streams and lakes as quickly. They help to settle out um, contaminants and sediments that would otherwise enter the waterways, and they also help to um, protect water quality in that way. So it is the responsibility of the party designated in the maintenance agreement. So typically that falls on homeowners associations. And some of the best management practices for maintaining those detention basins are to discontinue or reduce fertilizer use. Um, this reduces the nutrient load in those detention basins and that helps to prevent uh, algal blooms, which nobody likes to look at and certainly nobody likes to take care of. So it's better to nip that in the bud if you can. Um, if you maintain a buffer or a no-mow zone around the perimeter of the detention basin, that helps to absorb those nutrients if you do use fertilizers. And it also helps um, to deter geese. Uh, they really prefer habitats that they uh, are, are open, they can see any predators around them. So if you let that tall grass grow in, you let shrubs and trees grow there, it's going to get rid of some of those geese, which in turn gets rid of some of the waste that the geese leave behind. Street sweeping can reduce the sediments that enter the basin, so you'll have less of that sedimentation in there, that cloudy water um, that looks a bit turbid. Um, if you haven't already, you want to obtain a copy of your detention basin plan. Um, it will indicate the proper function of the pond so that you can better manage it and make sure that it's working correctly. Um, and lastly, you want to pick up after your pets. I doubt anybody here is leaving their dog's poo all around the neighborhood. You guys are the association members. You guys are like the the um, chief volunteers for making sure things are working correctly in a neighborhood. So I doubt that's going on, but it's one of our, one of our tips. So on a monthly basis, you want to keep clear and consistent records of all the activities that are happening in and around these detention ponds. You want to check for and remove the litter that you find. Um, that includes raking out dead vegetation and picking up whatever is blown into the detention pond in the last storm or um, other weather event. You want to monitor for invasive species, such as Phragmites, purple loosestrife, and flowering rush. Um, invasive species are super aggressive, and they can impede the function of detention basins if left unchecked. Um, and in addition to these things, you want to make sure that the inlet and the outlet of the detention basin is clear so that it can function properly. On a yearly basis, you want to do a, a more thorough inspection of the inlet and outlet pipes, as well as the riprap that you likely have at the inlet. Um, for those unfamiliar, the riprap uh, is often large boulders or bits of concrete that helps to slow down and interrupt the flow of water into the detention basin so that it's not eroding away. Um, you want to check those sediment levels. That's one of the um, maintenance things that I recommend on a monthly basis as well. Um, you can have a licensed professional uh, come and conduct a wet weather inspection of the basin to ensure that it's working properly. Um, and you want to inspect for major erosion, especially after large storm events, um, as well as on an annual basis. So properly maintaining your detention basin will overall, the, the big point here is that it'll reduce the work that you have to put in in the future. So there's costs associated with um, maintaining a detention basin and making sure that it works properly. So if you keep up on a monthly basis and on a yearly basis with these best management practices, it's going to make the job easier for you in the long run. So checking in on those invasive species, seeing if they're there, and if they are there, you can contact the Watershed Council, you can contact the Oakland County CISMA, and we can help with that invasive species management. Um, excess sediment accumulation in the pond, as well as in those pipes, as well as any kind of blockage that's happening in the inlet and the outlet. And uh, 
Yeah, as I said, the costs associated with that overdue maintenance, you want to avoid that if at all possible because the, the budgets of homeowners associations, you guys are well familiar with how little wiggle room you have to take care of issues. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I can try to help to answer some questions. I'm not an engineer, but um, I am a stormwater expert, so I can, I can try and help you guys out with any, any concerns. And the Clinton River Watershed Council has been getting involved with different homeowners associations and neighborhoods around the watershed, um, trying to help uh, install native plants and manage those detention basins. We're, we're we like to be a contact for any kind of public education opportunity. So if you guys want to learn more about how stormwater affects our natural resources, um, get in contact with us. We'd love to come speak. And um, yeah, I guess I want to open up to questions. Yeah. So we have one for Macomb County. We're currently working on one for Oakland County because we do have a running list of licensed professionals who will offer those services. We're currently developing that. So if you want to get in touch with us, we can give you our, our sort of rudimentary list of who we have, but we don't have an official, an official listing. Yeah. That would be the city. So I believe um, Paul is going to come up in a minute um, from the Department of Public Services, and he can answer that question uh, more in depth, I believe. Yeah. Really, really crazy. For sure. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's we get these these huge storm events, and it's a it's a common problem throughout uh, across the watershed. But particularly Rochester Hills is one of those older communities. Some of these detention basins are starting to see these problems, and and they're all they're all catching up with us now. So you're you're definitely not alone with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned in your slides uh, invasive species of plants. Mm -hmm. But one of our biggest problems at our pond is not a plant, it's an animal, it's a muskrat. Oh, yes. uh, we have trapped muskrats, but besides the trapping process, is there anything else that you can recommend as far as discouraging the animal? As far as discouraging them, that's, a, that's something I personally struggle with. I, uh, my parents' homeowner association, I live over in Macomb, but um, as far as discouraging them, it is tough because you want to have these natural uh, areas around the detention basin, but then that encourages nature to come and move in. And they can be incredibly destructive, so understandably you want to trap and get rid of those. But in terms of um, recommendations that I personally have, I'm not, really, I'm not really savvy on how to get rid of muskrats, but that might be a question. Um, <sighs> Department of Natural Resources might have something on that, but as far as I know, you got to trap them and get them out of there. That's that's the best I've got. Yeah. So when our uh, subdivision shares a natural watershed with some of the schools in our area, and if if we had a mixed use drainage with one of the schools, and who could we talk with about about us maintaining that property that the school drains into? Would that be you, or, or who could help us with that? We could certainly help you with that. Um, anybody who's uh, draining or discharging directly into the river has to have a uh, MS4 permit, and we're one of the, um, one of the groups that helps to uh, administer the requirements of those permits, so we can definitely help out with um, how to maintain that, what you guys can do versus what the school has to do. Um, so yeah, you could definitely get in touch with us on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's it, then I guess I'm gonna turn it back over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Kaylee. <laughs> Up next, we have Paul Davis with our Department of Public Service. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, I am an engineer. In fact, I'm 
your city engineer for the last 21 years. So I can also be a resource um, for the homeowner association representatives tonight for stormwater. We work well with the Clinton River Watership Council. They're a terrific partner for the city. And uh, in regards to getting copies of your detention base and plans, uh, we have a lot of records at the city. It's likely that we have a plan from the original construction of your subdivision that would include detention base and drawings. It, it might, sometimes they include the calculations for the sizing of the basin and, and uh, how it exactly it was built. And uh, other times it doesn't, but it's likely that we'll have something um, uh, in regards to your storm sewer system. So please feel free to come to the Department of Public Services and uh, you know, ask um, us to assist if in addition to any assistance you might get from Clinton River Watershed Council. So tonight I'm here to talk about the good news and bad news topic. Now the bad news is it's gonna be a lot of construction in the community and it's gonna be inconvenient. Um, a lot of work's gonna happen for infrastructure improvements. The good news, there's gonna be a lot of work in the community for infrastructure improvements this year. So um, it's a good sign. The city does reinvest a significant amount of money every year to maintain the infrastructure in good condition. We have hundreds of miles of water and sewer. Um, just top the 100 mile mark for our pathway system. Uh, we have storm drainage. We have hundreds of miles of uh, roads, um, a mixture of local and major roads. and. It, it takes a big program every year in order to kind of stay on top of that, uh, those large systems and make sure they're functioning correctly. So what I'm gonna do is just go through this year's program. I'll try and go through it pretty quickly because I realize that a lot of this work may not pertain to your individual subdivisions um, that you're representing tonight, but at some point it will during one of these meetings. And um, over the 20 years, or more that I've been working. It's uh, I've been in a lot of subdivisions and, and seen a lot of work go on for the city. So our first project, we typically have a yearly local concrete repair program. When I first started here in the city, we would do a complete subdivision. We would redo all the concrete roads in that subdivision. And because concrete construction is so expensive and it, it, it's so, um, uh, impactful to uh, uh, and inconvenient into a, a single subdivision. We only were doing like one subdivision a year. It's, it's tough to, to take the monies and, and put it all into one subdivision a year when there's many areas that are deteriorating at different rates throughout the community. So what we did is for many years now, we've done kind of a concrete repair program where we're not doing entire subdivisions, but we do selective slab replacements. We look where the bad slabs are in subdivisions and we try and spread a lot of the work around. Typically our concrete roads are in the northwest quadrant of the city, so year after year that's typically the subdivisions that we're in. But we're gonna do 17,500 square yards of concrete replacement. Um, this year is a little different in that we are actually gonna do some sidewalk replacement in three large subdivisions uh, this year, Arcadia Park, Avon Manor, and Yorktown Commons. And the reason why we're bidding it with our concrete program is we were having a lot of difficulties getting contractors to bid just on sidewalk work. We, one time, one year we were, didn't even get any bids and we ended up having to kind of wrap it in the concrete program. So it just makes sense for the city to do this in order to um, get that work done also. Our next um, project is our local asphalt repair program. This program um, is for uh, a, typically a milling and an overlaying within subdivision roads uh, or subdivisions that have asphalt roads. This program goes much quicker than concrete. Concrete's a longer process with the curing and, and part with construction. It just typically takes the, the whole construction season to do, whereas our asphalt program can go much quicker because like you've probably seen on roads, um, they, they can, once they get the roadway prepared, um, and in this case, it's only milling the existing roadway, they'll come in and they put in like an inch and a half of asphalt. It goes very quickly, returns the um, subdivision roads to, uh, useful condition. So this year we're gonna be in the Tinkin Manor and Long Meadows subdivisions. Uh, we're also gonna be in the East Hampton subdivision. Um, with East Hampton though, we're also gonna do a, um, 
adjacent section of the John R. Pathway along with our local asphalt program. These, these projects I'm mentioning, they've all been bid. We're um, having pre-construction meetings right now. We're setting up the schedules with the contractors. So they're getting ready to go pretty soon. Typically the asphalt plants open in mid-April. So it's right around now where they'll start opening. So it's good timing for us to get these projects going. And they were bid um, typically a couple months ago. Another project, Waterview Reconstruction. Waterview Drive is in an industrial subdivision that's um, uh, west of Leach and north of Auburn Road. It's about 3,200 um, feet of pavement replacement we're gonna be doing there. And in this particular spot, we're gonna actually be adding a five foot sidewalk into that subdivision that will connect up to Adams Road and um, the Clinton River Trail has connectivity up there. After that, well, during this season, uh, Old Perch Rehabilitation and North Adams Pathway. Old Perch has been deteriorating. That mile section, we're gonna actually um, mill, uh, or we're gonna actually do a full reconstruction. We're not gonna mill it. What we found out is a lot of times we do pavement cores on these roadways, and we found out Old Perch has much less pavement than we thought it did. It was kind of surprising. So we're gonna rebuild it, put in a thicker asphalt section, and it should be better and last longer. And along with that project that was bid, we're gonna construct a new pathway on the east side of Adams Road. It's gonna complete um, a missing pathway gap that's basically north of Powderhorn. There's, there's an ending there. But then Premier Academy, if you go down south from Tinkin, there's, there's a spot where it ends there too. We're gonna to fill in that gap. It's gonna go in front of Nowicki Park. So it's, it's a good, even though there's a pathway on the west side, um, it's good to have pathway on the east side also, so you don't have to deal with crossing Adams Road. Borden Park parking lot paving. Um, it was talked about the Borden Park earlier, uh, about how, um, you know, typically we have a Festival of the Hills event there. It's very, very well attended. Borden Park's very popular. That's where the pickleball courts are that the mayor was talking about. So one of the things we're doing there is we're gonna, um, repave all the parking lots there and also all the, the walkways that are a part of that. This project is um, ready to go. The contractors talked about starting next Monday um, and having the first half of the project, which is the west half, uh, completed by the Festival of the Hills. So we've threatened them with their lives. Uh, they better come through with this. It's got to be done by June 26th, and they've definitely committed. They're going to have it, that first half done, and then the remainder of the project will be completed the beginning of September, September 2nd. Auburn Road Rehabilitation and Water Main Replacement. This is a mile and a half section of Auburn Road from Rochester to Culbertson. Uh, it's, um, it's actually a section that the city recently took ownership of. Um, previous, a few years ago, MDOT owned all of Auburn Road. It was the old M59, all six miles was under MDOT's jurisdiction. Even at, we have our public works building there and it was kind of frustrating because um, we didn't plow that road. You know, our own building right there and we didn't drop the plow, it was MDOT and their, their agreement with the road commission. So um, what happened with the Auburn Road corridor project is because we wanted to do something different and really kind of do something unique in that corridor, we wanted to take ownership of that half mile. Well, MDOT said, we don't wanna just give one half mile of jurisdiction over, we wanna give a two mile stretch. So now the city owns Rochester to DeQuinder. And as part of that agreement with MDOT, we received some funding for that, um, but we were on the hook for doing a road rehabilitation of that remaining mile and a half section. So that we're following through, we had five years to do it. We're gonna actually follow through early on our commitment and um, we're gonna do a one and a half inch, um, or no, excuse me, a three inch mill and overlay on that section of the roadway, but we also have about a mile and a half of old water main that we wanna replace. So we're using a method, it's, uh, it's a pipe bursting, it's, it's basically a trenchless replacement of the existing water main and replacing it in its existing location. We've been doing that a lot in the subdivisions, it's a lot less disruptive to replacing older water mains. And um, it's, uh, it's, a very, it's probably our most expensive project we're doing this year and that one will take all summer. Avon and Livernoy water main installation, you may have noticed on the northwest corner of Avon and Livernoy, there's one home that's being built there now, but ultimately there's gonna be five homes. And uh, in the process of going through with uh, the developer, 
it was found that our 16 inch water main was just too difficult and, and although we tried with our contractor a couple times to tap that water main, it just wasn't happening. So the city actually is gonna be constructing um, about 290 feet of new water main. It's a small project, but it's, it's um, very important for those new homes that are gonna be built there. I talked about pipe bursting and um, for several years now we've been pipe bursting water mains within subdivisions and this year we're going to be working on the Spring Hill Meadow Creek condos uh, water main replacement. We're going to be putting in approximately over 19 almost 20,000 feet of new water main. Uh, I mean that's a little less than four miles but it's it's a lot of water main replacement it's old, it's, uh, in some areas it's undersized, some of the water main is six inch, where typically you wouldn't put in a six inch water main, you would go with an eight inch minimum. So that'll be a, a big project that affects those uh, residents in that subdivision, but it, it's for a good reason. And hopefully with the pipe bursting method that we have, it will minimize their impact. Rochester Road resurfacing, once in a while, you know, with our program this year, we've got about $31 million that city council awarded for projects that the city's administering. It's a significant amount of money, but there's actually even more work that's being invested in the community. And um, this is an example of uh, one such project, Rochester Road resurfacing. This is an inch and a half overlay that's gonna start from Tinkin Road, and it's gonna go all the way up to Lakeville Road in Oakland Township. I think it's about a $3.8 million project for the Road Commission. It's gonna be done under traffic, so it'll be one of those roads that kinda stinks. Uh, they will maintain two-way traffic, but it, sometimes it might have one-way flagger control. Other times, um, the, the lanes might be a little narrower than what you're used to driving on while the contractor's working in the area. So um, that that's good. Uh, they, um, believe are planning on starting in June on that project and that project will go uh, through I think mid-October. Another project that the Road Commission is doing is um, resurfacing Livernois Road and from South Boulevard to Avon uh, they asked the city if we wanted to participate in in a resurfacing of that and we jumped on it um, whenever we can uh, use our tri-party funding or have the Road Commission as a partner. We want to take advantage of those opportunities. So that resurfacing project is going to uh, occur this summer. One project that I didn't mention that is ongoing. So um, it, it started already or last November, the Avon to Quinder improvement. That's another large project the Road Commission has been working on. Um, they, they've been replacing the Avon Road Bridge just east of DeQuinder. And uh, that that problem that project the bridge replacement and they're going to be constructing a new roundabout there is um, over seven million dollars in itself. This November, the Great Lakes Water Authority is going to st start working on the replacement of a very large eight foot diameter water main. It's going to go from Hamlin Road all the way up to Avon, then it's going to jog um, around by Avon, and then to continue up to Quinder Road till where it hits the Clinton Oakland Trail, Macomb Orchards Trail. And then it's gonna go east all the way to 24 Mile in Macomb County. Very large project. It's gonna be several years of disruption. It's gonna get going. The middle section actually by Avon Road and Yates Cider Mill this November. They're kind of working as best they can around the cider season. Um, but that project also is gonna have another roundabout built at the Avon to Quinder and 23 Mile Road. So out of the 31 mil, I mean, there's even more, many more millions of dollars that are being um, invested in the community here. So a lot of road work, but um, ultimately it's, it's, it's much better to do the road work than not to do it. The, what I want to end on here is the city has a um, interactive construction map that you can go to and get information on projects. And you know, if you forget where I talked about tonight, a particular project's going, you can go to rochesterhills.org and under the Department of Public Services tab, you'll find a link that will take you to the interactive construction map. We're in the process of updating this now because like I said, we're meeting with the contractors and we're getting their schedules and when they intend to start projects. Um, but we're posting information on this site to kind of give just a, a, a quick overview of what these various projects involved. So there's um, all road, water, sewer, um, drain projects, pathway projects, they'll all be on this. Um, and if you don't want to go to this and don't want to use your computer, you can always call the Department of Public Services. We'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I didn't show the subdivisions. I, 
they're in the northwest part of the city, but there is going to be um, some subdivisions. It's, you know, our two and a half million doesn't go very far, but um, I, I can show you this later. But these areas that are in blue are kind of in the northwest part of the community, and there's spots where we're going to be, there's little black lines here that show the extent in each area of where the concrete replacement's going to be. My card is back there, but there are other people that can help you. Um, we've got other engineers that help assist with the administration of these projects. And yes, if you know, we want you to call and notify us if there's been some cracking or areas that have um, failed prematurely. We do have um, bonds, and, and we a lot of times don't file final projects out until the following spring or summer. Um, because we want to make sure the restoration gets completed and accepted. And sometimes we have areas of the grass that just doesn't grow. A lot of times that stuff is being, trying to be um, the turf established at the end of the fall. And, and uh, so anyhow, a lot of times the projects are carried over. And if there are any areas that you feel we should look at and go over with the contractor, please call us and let us know. Um, yeah. Just carry on a little bit on just to carry on a little bit with that question, um, do you prefer the homeowner association to contact you, or do you want the individual homeowner to contact you? I'm a, I'm in a 429 unit, so, I, and I don't know if there's any problems, so I don't know if I should be asking, or, or how do you want that to come? It, it can be either way. You know, typically we like working better with homeowner associations because we can kind of lump multiple concerns into one person to deal with, but. Um, if individual property owners want to contact us, that's absolutely fine too. And, and there's just another follow-up question, not a follow-up, but a different question. Regarding paths, do we have any, uh, does the city have like a regulation or anything of how wide paths or sidewalks are supposed to be? Okay. We, we've got two things. We've got pathways and we've got sidewalks. A pathway is typically eight foot wide, um, usually asphalt, but we do have concrete ones. But the eight foot wide is uh, one of the criteria. The other main criteria, though, is that the city owns it. The city maintains it. The city replaces it, repairs it, um, sometimes overlays it. So, and sidewalks within subdivisions are typically five foot wide concrete. And it's the adjacent property owner that's responsible for maintaining those um, by our ordinance. But um, that, that's the typical distinction between the two. Well, first, let me just say thank you for trying to fix the roads and keeping everything up and running. So appreciate that a lot. Um, I'm a member of the HOA board of a smaller subdivision. There's only about 250 of us. But I do know that um, we're in the northwest subdivision area and, and some of our concrete is starting to deteriorate. So if we did see some of these issues, you're saying it's better for us to approach you as a group or your, your, your team as a group to, to try to identify some things we'd like to have fixed? I'd rather deal with one person than 10 people, but you know, okay. 10 people is fine too, if that's how it goes. You know, and, and when we do our road programs, we, we kind of rely on th three things in order. First, we have a group of city employees that have been trained to kind of go through, uh, we use a PACER system. It's basically a, a windshield observation of the roads conditions and, and these roadway segments are ranked from a one to a 10. Um, a, a 10 is a brand new road, very good condition. A one is like a disaster and, and you know, a failure. So we go through our local roads and, and drive them and rate them. And if you look at our capital improvement plan, you'll see a listing in there of what all the poor local roads are. And um, I think just the poor ones, but we know the fair ones and the good ones too. That That's one method we use. We also use our, our uh, public works crews they're out on the roads all the time in different areas, and they may tell us of some bad areas of uh, roadway in the community, and, and we'll make a list of that and, and consider that and go look at them. But then we also rely on the residents. You know, if, if a resident says, look, this, this road is icing up every winter. It's terrible. It's unsafe. If, um, you know, th this road this past year has just totally fallen apart because of all the potholes, and, and roads can deteriorate at different rates, and, and one road can, like you probably remember Livernois Road um, between Walton and Avon, the one year it just like, 
all the joints were terrible and concrete was popping out. All the re little repairs we did were, the road commission did were popping out all over. Just in one season, it significantly got worse. So we rely on residents to also kind of help us. Now we try and stay objective and take all the concerns. Just if you call us every day, that doesn't mean we're gonna add your section of road, but we will look at the areas and then we'll every year put together a program to address how we think they, it should go. Fair enough. And um, if we did have a collection of complaints, I know there's probably been half a dozen repavement of uh, driveways and maybe they don't line up with the road and a few other smaller issues and some cracks and stuff and whatnot. What, what time of the year would be the best time to approach you if, if we could make it onto the agenda? Is it better in the fall or the spring or? or? I'd say don't wait. Just okay. let us know. As soon as you think it's an issue, we'll come out and look at it and meet with you. Um, I have uh, just recently met with a, a, a homeowner. There, we had three driveways that were cracking from a program a couple of years ago. And just this past year, they, they all of a sudden started cracking. And three out of four driveways. So we're looking at it. And uh, in, in this instance, it's probably going to be the city that has to do it because there is a time where the contractor actually is released from the responsibility and they don't have to go back. And it, of course, these driveways crack just after that. But we'll look at them and, and if we can, we have the contractor redo them. Um, it, and if not, then we'll we'll make a determination. If it's like hairline cracks that are maybe, and you know, we have some homeowners that are, are very picky on the driveways, and even a hairline crack is the end of the world. We may not do that, and we may just say, look, you can just epoxy that crack, but it, to, to tear out the whole slab and replace and pour a new concrete slab, it, it's just not a, a good decision for us to make uh, on that, and, and we may not re have those, you know, all of them replaced, but we will come look at them, and I would encourage you um, whenever. Uh, don't wait for a specific time to call us. Okay, thank you for that, and I just have one more question. I apologize for taking so much time, <laughs> but... Um, do you keep a list of potential workers in the area or teams that you would recommend to do a driveway? I know we've got some pretty big driveways in ours, or is there a good rec good place where we could find information on that? You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because it kind of came up with a question to Kaylee about storm water cleaning. And uh, the city can't recommend contractors. It, it's just not something we can do, but we do have a list of um, contractors that have indicated that they want to do work in the community. We have it for a contractor that might install like a water lead to a home. Um, we can provide that list to you and we can also tell you contractors that have done work in the community recently. Um, but to recommend an individual type contractor, we, we won't do that. Typically on our concrete and, and asphalt programs or when we're in near a subdivision, we send out letters. A lot of times the city will send one out that kind of gives some specifics. And a lot of times one that the mayor um, signs himself and sends out to kind of give additional information will accompany that. We try and communicate as best we can. We've been um, encouraging people. A lot of our projects, we've adopted the Constant Contact app on a lot of our projects. And we want to try and get your emails. And, and like on some of these bigger projects, we will... Um, have weekly email updates to try and keep people advised of the work that's coming, you know, the next week. Um, typically in, in a subdivision, we'll do door hangers to try and tell people because there's always someone in our local road programs that has a special need. I mean, we've had weddings, graduation parties, uh, people that have, you know, specific cancer treatments on a day. I mean, I've heard a bunch of very specific needs that need to be accommodated, and we want to know those. So we have inspectors that are part of the, each of our projects. Sometimes it's a consultant that we hire to do that. But that inspector, what we want to do is have them hear any specific individual needs that someone might have. To And it could be like, look, I'm not going to be here this weekend, but I'm I'm going to be home all next weekend with a giant party. Don't tear out my driveway next weekend. I'd rather have you do this one or, or a couple weekends later. And those kind of things we deal with all the time. So we, I, I'm big on communication. You know, that, that makes a project succeed or fail all the time. And uh, we do our best to try and communicate. Having said that, some people say they still don't get stuff from us. And, and, uh, but we try and do as 
good a job as we can in that aspect. Usually we'll send out a letter at the beginning of the project, but like say our concrete construction, in, when we're going into subdivisions and redoing concrete, the contractor works in one area and then moves to the next and then the next, and, and you may not really see any work until the later half of the summer at, on your street. So what we try and do is follow that up with, with a door hanger or, or, or something more specific closer to the date when you're actually going to see some activity in your home. And that's, it, it generally works out. We really don't get a lot of complaints. Um, and I think it's because of the effort of communication that we put into it. Yeah, it, actually, if you go into the concrete link on here, it'll, it'll show like all the little individual areas where we're gonna be working on concrete. It'll do the same thing with asphalt. Asphalt, there's just a few subdivisions this year, but um, yeah, if you wanna zero in on where exactly the concrete work's going, this map would be a good place to try and find that out. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Up next from Forestry and Natural Resources, we have John Mayuk. Hey, everybody. I'm John Mayuk. I'm one of the three arborists at Rochester Hills. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about trees and natural resources today. So, mm, personally, mm, the most important thing that we do is plant trees. Uh, we do a lot of other work with the trees, um, but planting trees is incredibly important right now. Um, we have two different programs. Um, one is our street tree program. It's completely free. Um, as long as there is room in the city right-of-way in front of um, either residents' homes or subdivision commons, uh, we can plant trees there as long as it is within the right-of-way. Um, and these trees are planted um, both in May and later on in the fall, usually around November. Um, and they're pretty good sized trees. We've got a good list online. Um, if you go to rochesterhills.org slash trees. Um, and always accepting applications. So if you think you might want a tree, um, just go submit an application. We'll get you in on the next program we have. Um, and a newer one is our community canopy program. Um, we partnered with the Arbor Day Foundation and they set up a website for us where you can um, look at an aerial photo, um, and this is more specifically towards um, residential homes on private property um, off of the right-of-way, um, but we also have the ability to work with HOAs um, to plant on commons areas. Um, that, you'll just need to contact our natural resources manager, Matt Einhauser, to get a little bit of coordination on. Um, the site isn't really set up to handle multiple um, trees in commons areas. Um, but it's a great program. Um, you'll get a tree delivered in the mail and it's up to you and the residents to plant them yourselves. They're pretty small and it is, uh, you'll need to be a little bit patient with them, um, but it's completely free um, and a really good way to get some native trees in your neighborhoods. Um, and this coming spring, I just wanted to point out, um, watch for landscapers, how they put mulch down. Um, don't mound up mulch by trunks. Um, for a variety of reasons, it's just not good for the tree. It's much better to be wider than it is to be thick. If you can have about three inches um, of depth and no mulch touching the trunk, that's perfect. Um, generally, you want the mulch to be as wide as the um, canopy of the tree. Um, that's not always going to be realistic for um, how you want the landscape to look, but the wider the better. Um, if you're taking a picture, I'll go back real quick. <laughs> um, and for tree planting, um, if you don't, for whatever reason, want to go through our program um, to plant a tree on um, city right-of-way, um, it is important for you to contact us. Um, the, there's a permit involved with planting a tree um, it's completely free. We just want to make sure that it's getting, um, the right tree is getting planted in the right place and we'll work with you and probably try and convince you to just go through our program because it's a good sized tree for free. Um, if you remove a tree, there is a fee associated with that permit, um, except for a few exceptions. Um, dead trees and, um, 
structural issues. Um, and on private property, there is, um, in some situations, um, a requirement for a tree remover, tree remo tree removal permit. Um, and if you go to our website, that's going to be the easiest way to find out the information on that. It's a um, there's a lot of different stipulations based on why you're um, needing to remove the tree and the size of the property involved. Um, and but the quick checklist is here um, of if it's um, the parcel is smaller than an acre then generally you can do just about anything you want. If it's larger than an acre, just for this um, sake of being able to preserve as much canopy as possible in the city, that's when we try and work with homeowners. Um, and in terms of constructing new property, um, that's when we're also gonna need a tree removal permit. Um, and then one of the programs that I participate personally with um, and work with our contractors in is the tree maintenance um, program where we have a seven, five to seven year rotation throughout the entire city and we try and get to every tree um, every five to seven years and make sure that we're taking care of, most importantly, that it's not interfering with the use of the road and sidewalks. Um, but also to be able to look for any structural issues. Um, it's the best way for us to be able to monitor the health of the trees um, and just make sure that there aren't any issues. Um, and so you'll often see us when we're pruning out there that we're not just kind of making that box that it shows in the picture, that we're all really working with the full canopy to address um, any future problems that we can um, nip it in the bud, as they say. Um, and one of the things that our natural resources um, team does is um, we have contractors who work with us to do um, Phragmites removal. Um, and, but what this, uh, it, it's a great program because Phragmites is um, one of the most prevalent invasives in the city. Um, it can cause a lot of issues. Um, it still is up to the homeowner association to pay the fee um, for the Phragmites removal, but um, I think through how we've contracted the removal with our contractors, um, you're going to get a much better rate because they're charging the rate that they do for the entire city. Um, and so at scale, um, they do many more acres than, and you get a better rate than if it's just one person working with the contractor. So it's a great program if you have a Phragmites issue. Um, and just a couple things, I'll go through this pretty quick. Um, we have a lot of um, present and soon to be present invasive issues in Rochester Hills. Um, most people are probably familiar with gypsy moths. Um, the um, entomological, and I'm gonna have trouble saying this, entomology um, society, uh, has recently changed the name from gypsy moth to spongy moth um, to be a little bit dis less disparaging to any particular people. Um, so um, you'll see on um, all the federal and state um, literature that they're now referred to as spongy moths. So if you see spongy moth, it is referring to gypsy moths. Um, and these are not as destructive as they were in the past. Um, there are some natural um, enemies kind of gaining ground on them, helping suppress their populations. Um, but we occasionally do need to spray, and we'll work with um, neighborhoods when that comes up. Because um, more likely than not, there will be places every year that we need to spray. Spotted lanternfly has not been seen in Michigan yet. I think maybe one dead one has, um, but they are currently in Northeast Ohio, and these sound like they're gonna be a huge nuisance. Um, not extremely damaging, but just a really big nuisance to the point where people researching them had to um, carry umbrellas to walk underneath infected trees just because of all the honeydew that they were releasing, and so it's gonna be a mess when they get here. So if you see any insect that looks like that, that call should go straight to the Michigan DNR um, because that's going to be something that they're going to want to act on pretty quickly. And that's called the spotted lanternfly. 
Um, and there's a long, long list of invasive plants, but two things I want to point out, um, calorie and flowering pear. There are still a lot of these trees um, being planted today. Um, you can go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy them right now. And I really want to encourage everybody to um, kind of spread the awareness that these are actually a pretty invasive um, and problematic tree. They're um, prone to breaking in storms much more than a lot of other trees because of the structure and the way they grow. Um, but they also spread into um, natural areas, including your common areas, um, where they won't be the nice ones that you see um, that you can buy from the nursery. They, um, when the seeds get planted, um, they kind of revert to their natural fo form, um, which is a little bit more spiky and then makes even more seeds. And it, they can spread and just cover entire meadows. Um, Oriental bittersweet is also a really, really aggressive vine. Um, if you see this in your commons areas, um, it is definitely worth removing. It's very difficult to remove once it's established. Um, it's a really um, tightly growing vine that can wrap around trees, um, smother them pretty quick. Um, and you can, um, it's pretty easy to tell what they look like when they have their orange berries, orange red berries. Um, but the vine itself um, should be pretty apparent just by how tightly it can wrap trees up. Um, and our natural resources um, program, um, we do a lot of outdoor engagement events. Um, if you want any information on any of those, um, you can go to our website at rochesterhills.org slash outdoors. Um, and very small on the screen is a couple um, of our programs coming up. Um, one that probably interests a lot of us here is gardening and landscaping with deer, which is not easy. Um, and then um, next week, the 29th already, I think it is, that's Arbor Day. Um, so we're gonna have a tree planting ceremony at um, Bloomer to celebrate the 100th year of the park. Um, free to come to, um, always great to see a tree planted. Um, and then fossils in Riverside campfire later on in May and a trip to Innovation Hills later on at the end of May. Um, but we try and get as many programs going as we can, um, so just stay updated on our website. And any questions? I don't know what else they're yep. called, but the stink bugs. Um, so that's, um, some stink bugs are fine. Um, if it's green, it's usually gonna be okay for stink bugs. Um, the brown ones, they're called the brown marmorated stink bugs. Those, um, so I moved from Virginia, it was a, I, some years I couldn't open a door without a few of them flying inside. They are here in Michigan, but they're not as bad because the winters we get here are a lot colder. And so when we get a really good deep freeze, that will set the population back a ton. So we're always gonna see them, but the populations are never gonna be to the point where it's too bad. Um, but they are gonna be present and they're just kind of a nuisance. We, we use the Phragmites mm -hmm. that you offered citywide. That's amazing. Really, really economical and they really do a great job. Uh, the other thing is, uh, an FYI, three years ago, we had a lot of commons area that we wanted to retree. We've been knocking down trees and, and trimming trees and so on. It was getting kind of barren. I came to the city forestry department and they put us in touch with the company that was doing all the tree work at Innovation Hills. Got a great deal. So we put three trees or nine trees a year at about 300 bucks a piece and they're good, solid, tall trees and uh, a great variety. So I would encourage you to think about that. I'm, as long as we're on Fragmighty, a mm -hmm. couple of things. Um, the, the golf course uh, that the city owns on South Boulevard, um, that's full of Fragmighty. Why can't we get the contractor who rents that from us to clean that up? Because it spreads. Yeah. That's you a know, good the question. seeds go all yep. over. Same thing on the south side of Bo uh, South Boulevard is Troy, and that Fragmighty is 15 feet tall in the summer. Yeah, um, unfortunately the ones in Troy 
we can send them yeah we can send them a nice email um, but the ones on our, our own golf course that is a good question that I'll ask my natural resources manager because that's um, pine traces yeah you know, just loaded yeah I thinking back to what I've seen there it's probably pretty bad right now so uh, I'll, I'll ask Matt and there's hopefully a good reason but otherwise it'll be on his radar from there okay thanks mm -hmm. all righty well thank you everybody thanks John up next we have the Rochester Hills Fire Department John Lyman good evening it is a pleasure being with you uh, thinking about what Mayor Barnett said, uh, talked about about retirements. I have not because of this meeting, but I have uh, announced that I will be retiring uh, July 7th. So this will be my last HOA meeting. It's been a pleasure serving here in Rochester Hills. I've only been here three years, uh, but I've been in the fire service. I'm in my 37th year, so I'm ready to move on. So, uh, but here we go here with Rochester Hills uh, Fire Department. Uh, I, I like to talk about what the fire department, where we're at and what we're doing and, um, and a little bit about some services that we can provide to your homeowners. Uh, of course, we have five stations. You have the Tinkin Road Station, the Meadowbrook Station on Walton. Headquarters is off of Livernoy there and uh, two and three are on Auburn Road on each side of the city. Uh, station three, just for your knowledge, for sake of knowledge, station three on the southwest corner is the busiest uh, station in the fire department. Busiest for fires and medicals. In 2021, we responded to 7,600 calls. I guess I can look up here, can I? That's nearly 12% over the 2020 uh, number. Now, 2020 with COVID, our numbers were down about, I think it was eight or 9%. So we uh, saw that uptick here of 12% in 2021. Of course, uh, we have been a member of the, of the Oakway Mutual Aid Group for uh, the last, uh, I'm going to say three or four years, they're 10 of the largest full-time staffed fire departments in Oakland County, uh, starting at 8 Mile with Ferndale, going all the way up to Waterford, uh, and uh, Rochester Hills here would be the farthest north communities. Uh, they, are, they stand ready to respond to communities outside of our first response area, uh, especially when their services are overwhelmed. The uh, golf course fire, we had a couple, a couple crews over there. Uh, at a time assisting um, this, uh, the township, uh, Bloomfield Township with that. So um, all the Oakway departments were there with that. Um, so we can trade resources back and forth. Uh, we have, uh, with Oakway, the, the fire department's trained together, so we're ready for hazmat, high angle rope rescue, peer support, which is a new team, uh, structural collapse, and then trench and confined space. So proud to be a, a member of the Oakway Mutual Aid group. Last year, our annual uh, fire prevention open house, we were able to reopen the doors to, uh, to Station One, and we had a great crowd. You can see some pictures there. We, we had a, a live fire demonstration. We had Sparky there to greet kids, and the fire safety house was, was open uh, for kids to crawl through smoke. Uh, watch for our announcement in October 22 uh, for that event. Some more pictures. You can see smoke in the, in the background with that big fire that we did. Uh, we had Icon Restoration, who's a business here in Rochester Hills, partner with us in building that and, and putting all the, uh, the pieces together for that uh, event. That was really cool. Fire Marshal Bill Cook, I think that's a great picture of him, uh, high-fiving or fist-bumping one of the kids there. Very, it was a great attended event. Um, we can, you can find us on social media all the time. I try to send stuff. Uh, to the mayor's office to get on social media. We also have our digital signs at stations one and four. And uh, the mayor's office does a great job of, I send, <clears throat> excuse me, I send her ideas and she somehow uh, puts them up there and manipulates them so they look good on the signs. In fact, I got a call from a resident uh, just yesterday saying how uh, much information she gains from the digital sign at station number one. Um, so uh, you can watch for us there. And then the keep snow and ice three feet away from hydrants, that's really important when we get these springtime snowstorms, like Monday. Let's hope that's gone, hey? Um, so anyway, you can, you can watch for our messages there. 
Uh, risk reduction services, that's the division I work for in the fire department. There's, uh, we do fire safety education in schools and senior centers. Um, of course, we provide CPR and first aid. If you're interested in that or your residents are interested in that, they can go to the eventbrite.com website and sign up. If you, uh, if you search Rochester Hills CPR, it'll come up very, very quickly. Uh, we're, I'm doing home safety surveys in homes all the time, smoke and CO alarm installation. I think I installed about 400 smoke and CO alarms in our city uh, last year. And I have uh, deaf and hard of hearing alarm devices or little bed shakers if you have deaf or hard of hearing uh, residents in your neighborhoods. That's a great little device and those are provided free of charge. Uh, Car seat installation and inspections are also uh, available, and you, again, you can go to the eventbrite.com website to sign up, and that's a free service as well. Couple ideas uh, for your home home security tips. Display your address properly. If, if I, obviously if your house is on fire, I can see the smoke. But if you call for other reasons, and I can't see your address, and the written out 300, 4, T5, you know, spelling it out, that does not work, okay? Um, that's too hard to see in the middle of the night, in the daytime. We wanna see numbers, reflective numbers are great, contrasting numbers to whatever the colors of your houses are. Okay, this is a big deal in the spring here. Recreational fires are allowed, seasoned hardwood only. No permit is needed if you are using a UL ETL approved device, the stuff you buy it. At a, at a hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, if you burn in one of those devices, you do not need a permit. If you're burning on the ground, if you've built a, a brick, with landscape brick uh, burning perm, uh, burn pit, you need a permit, okay? There's requirements as to how close it can be to the building, how close it can be to lot lines. Uh, and then please, I beg you, never use gasoline to light your recreational fires, unless you wanna go bald very quickly. Uh, no permit needed again. There's some, so there's an idea, and I, I've seen these in the city. These uh, these uh, backyard uh, the brick fire pits that needs a permit. Please, uh, if you're going to do that, you got to get a permit. No burning of leaves in our city. That's what makes our city so so nice and doesn't smell like leaf smoke in the spring and in the fall. Uh, if you if back in the day, there were times you'd go in some communities and you'd be driving through them and it'd be a big cloud of smoke. And that's not, uh, that is not here in our city, so that's great. Uh, and I'll attend your annual membership meetings. If you have a membership meeting and you want a firefighter there to talk about the, uh, some of the ideas here in this one, in this presentation, uh, I am available till July 7th. Uh, or you can email me and we'll, we'll put something uh, together for you there. And there's my office number, my email address. That office number will be uh, whoever takes my position uh, in the coming and during the summer here, they'll most likely have that same phone number, so. And that is it. Questions for me. I know I'm a quick talker, but I wanna. How long, what's the life of a fire, uh, smoke alarm? Smoke alarm, we recommend every 10 years that you swap out smoke alarms. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I will come to your house, look at your smoke alarms. I was in two homes today. I think I installed uh, 11 smoke alarms today. So yeah, 10 years, every 10 years, we recommend smoke alarms replaced. CO alarms is the same way. Um, and we strongly recommend 10-year battery ones. Don't buy the ones with the nine volts. Just get the 10-year battery ones, you put them up and you forget about them, okay? What I found in the city too is a lot of older 35, 40-year-old electric smoke alarms, uh, those should be replaced. I found a lot of those. And what, what we're doing is if you buy those, I'll, I'll wire them up for you okay question the uh, outdoor permit for the fire pit how long is that good for a week a month it's good for the year from my understanding good for the year okay thank you i could be wrong but i believe that's that's it's for a year you can and you can get those permits at station one off of livernois oh the file of life yes yeah, I didn't mention that in my presentation, but the file of life, we do have those available. Again, that's a free deal where um, it's got a little pocket that you can put on your refrigerator. I gave out probably 120 of those last year. And then it's got, a, it's got a form on there for medical, for contact information. If you have residents that live by themselves, 
this file of life is so important because if they fall, if they have a, a heart attack or if they're unconscious, who do we call? Your file of life is so important to the fire department and uh, they are used all, I, I just, the, one of the houses I went to today, she had one sitting right on her refrigerator. So very, very important uh, that you have file of life and it's free of charge. Fire department's got them. Station one. Again, it's, pl it's been a pleasure serving in this community and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks, John. Up next, we have the Oakland County Sheriff's Department. We have Taser and his handler, Deputy Mark Hickson. Oh, I don't need a cur I don't need a cursor today. Does anybody not know who I am? Raise your hand if you don't know who I am. John doesn't know. All right, well, for the two or three. So my name is Deputy Mark Hickson. I uh, sheriff's deputy for Rochester Hills. I've been in Rochester Hills as sheriff's deputy since 1999. I've lived in the Rochester Hills, Rochester area since 1999. I've been the homeowner association president for I don't know how many years. Uh, they can have it back, but my well, my wife says that. Um, but either way. Um, and been with the sheriff's office for three months short of 25 years now. Um, I've done every presentation. If you already knew who I am, I either I, I was a school liaison for seven years, so I talked to I taught the you taught your kids in the school. So I didn't bring everything today. I, I've done target hardening. I've done what the sheriff's office does. I've done uh, I don't know how. I've, I think I've done everyone I can do. Maybe I'll start just recircling, uh, or recycling my presentations and starting all over again. So um, I got my new partner here. He's not new, but he's the first time I brought him here. Taser. If you don't know about Taser, anybody afraid of dogs? No, I mean, they're, they're legitimately, so I'll, he won't go far. We'll see if he, he's got a thing with shadows. If you know, don't, so if you didn't know this, this is my public safety announcement. Never use a laser for a dog. A dog can't reset its brain like a cat can, and a dog will get, like, fixated and then not be able to reset its brain. Sometimes i got to put a dog down. Um, so my, I, he has really this thing with shadows where he just gets a little warped up. So we have six therapy dogs now. The sheriff had therapy dogs up from three years ago. Um, so we have Taser and Oxford, which are the two. And then we have Scarlet, Callie, and Indy. Uh, Independence, uh, one has one downtown. And then uh, peer pressure support. And then Oxford was just purchased by Rochester, not Rochester, Oakland. I'm sitting this all wrong. Clarkston Schools bought the dog for Oxford Schools and named the dog Oxford. So um, a quick thing about the sheriff's office. I know that uh, the chief had his uh, map up here. We only have one. Uh, we have one substation off of um, uh, Barclay Circle. Uh, we run, I don't know how many cars we run in a night. Um, it all depends, right? We could run on the day shift. We have traffic cars. In the afternoon, we have traffic cars. Um, we have two seven to three cars. Which So we work on three different shifts in Rochester Hills. We work at eights, seven to three, three to 11, and 11 to seven. Um, and then we have cars that are in between to cover when people are going home. So two or three cars that work two to 10, which is kind of covers that three o'clock mark. A couple cars work seven to three. So there might be 15 cars on days, 15, 16, 17 cars on afternoons. Um, and then on midnights, you're going to get eh, probably six, seven, eight cars. It all depends. So I think there's 60 uh, to Rochester Hills. Uh, as a resident, I don't want 60. I want 100. Uh, that's just me. Um, I think we need to have a lot more. But that's the same thing with the fire department. I think they need a lot more, too. But that's that's a whole different BM than mine. So. Um, that's it. I, I, you know, I came here just to, like I said, I've done all my presentations I have for so many years. And I'll be happy to, this is a, a, I was telling Jody, it's actually a very large crowd um, from what's been in the past. You're agreeing. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's great. Um, but I'm here for, I mean, I did stats last time and we could, we could do that again too. So does anybody got any questions? I'm open for anything. I don't need to run home and tuck Owen in anymore because now he's 12. So I used to uh, jet off. So I'm open for anything. So you're part of the team that's made this one. The dream team that made the best neighborhood. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the highest, I'm the longest seniority at the substation. So um, you get people, they say with the sheriff's office that there's a lot of um, cycling. And, and it's a good way and a bad way. So um, you get, I say old timers, you get, like I live here, right? So I work here. And you got, who is here? That's the new Jamie. Uh, Jamie Kavlik is here and Clampett is here. And these guys that have been around for years and years because they live on the east side, right? I don't want to go to Commerce. So there's, because we cover 13 different areas, but I live and stay work here. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it can always be better. 
Um, but I've been here. I went. To, I did a small stint in Oakland Township for about uh, maybe a year, uh, and then came back here. Did the schools for seven years in this community. When we've always had a community liaison in Rochester Hills. Um, I spend every day just going out on businesses, going to neighborhoods. What I one of the things is what we offer. Oh, this look, there's Freiburg still up there. So Freiburg was the big guy for Oxford, but I can't get into too deep. But Freiburg was big into the old Oxford thing, so he's a great guy. Um, so I'll do target hardening in your home. I'll come do site surveys to your house, to your businesses. Um, I walk businesses all the time. I drive through neighborhoods. Um, I do secret squirrel stuff. I drive a uh, mini minivan, um, put a little soccer sticker back there. It's got lights and sirens. Pretty cool when you stop people. They got no idea what you're doing. Um, but it's kind of odd. So it just looks like, you know, you're driving through. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a good thing, so without a doubt. So. I have a question. Oh. Do, do you have any comments about um, – the beer po deer population last year and how many accidents there were compared to prior years? No, I don't. I know it wasn't as bad as it was a couple, well, it was our team. I'm on a SWAT team, too. I do a lot of things. I've been doing that for 23 years. Um, we were going to do the culling of the deer, like about, what, maybe, help me out, it was around like 15 years ago, sound right? Um, and then everybody didn't want to do it, and it was bad. It's your, everybody's own opinion. Um, but they're not any higher than what the way noticed in, in, in past years. Um, I didn't pull the numbers statistically, but if they're higher, they post them at the substation where they're at, because uh, we're going to get deer there all the time. But I haven't haven't noticed anything too much larger. So, did you have one there? Yeah, we have an issue with non-residents coming to our common areas, riding dirt bikes, quads, or bringing dogs off leash. Is that something where the homeowners association should contact the sheriff's office? Well, I, so here's the difficult part: should the homeowners association contact? No, absolutely not. It's the person who witnesses it right then. Right, because what happens is the next day they call me, I'm helping out. So I help out answer phones to the front desk. The deputy's up there, Diana Vitale, uh, you know, she's busy in the morning time. So I'll answer the phone call 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock before I go out for my day. So at 10 o'clock, somebody calls and said, yeah, three nights ago, you know, and I'm like, okay, I, you know. So I say that in a way like, no, I don't want me, the pre I'm a president of HOA, to call four days later and say there was dirt bikes out there, you know, on, on Easter. The person who witnesses it right then, you have to call us right then. So um, what subdivision? Shadowwoods. So, it's and where are they ride the dirt bikes at Shadowwoods? Uh, yep. All right. Yeah. Call us. You got to call us right then. Um, and with the dogs off leash, um, that's tricky because it's it's an ordinance, but it there's it's dog it's dog at large. Actually, let me get, to get real specific, it's it's actually animal at large. And an animal at large, they kind of, when you dig into it, is like goat, uh, cow, whatever. Um, so it's it's really tricky. Um, but are you, and is it a, is it someone like him, or is it someone who's is it like an aggressive dog, or just any dog? Well, that's tricky part because you say is it, it's biodegradable? Is it littering? Is it not littering? It, it's so you got to call us right then. Um, but, yeah, the animal at large one, um, again, is tricky, but you're going to get the guys who go out there and be like, hey, yeah, you, you just can't. You'll get might get a new deputy. When I say old and new deputies, um, the afternoon shift is awesome because if you're brand new to, 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 the, to the sheriff's office, where do you want to go? You want to go and be busy. So you're going to work Pontiac or Rochester as your two busiest contracts. So you want those guys there. Those are the guys that are going to go out there and, and, and work that. Um, but have them call right away. And then, you know, the older guys might be like, hey, uh, don't let your dog poop here because they want to keep going. The younger guys might push it through and see, and see what happens. But I, I do send things out every now and then to the whole department because, yeah, dog off leash is an Oakland Township thing, but it's actually animal at large, which is, which is kind of tricky. And then I would encourage if it's during the day to call animal control and have them come out there too. So there, there is not a trespassing. So trespassing has to be all sorts of tricky things. Trespassing has to be posted. Trespassing has to have the person go there, see the trespassing sign, right? So uh, if I walk to an area where I didn't see the sign, I'm not trespassing because I can say I didn't see the sign. Trespassing has to be me showing up, telling you to leave, and you refusing to leave. Then it has to be a representative of, of the homeowner association. I'm the president of mine. Am I the representative or are all my constituents or all my residents a member? I would say all my residents. Well, now they got to be the complainant. And you're going to get, oh, I, well, well, wait a minute, I, I was just calling, I don't want, and then it just goes downhill from there because I can't be, if it's a misdemeanor not committed in my presence outside of drunk driving, assault and battery, and police officer, and domestic violence, I don't, I don't have enforcing. So that's a, misdem that's a misdemeanor, and I, I didn't see it. So 
Um, you just got to be. That's why you see the no hunting trespassing signs, but they're like every 15 feet. So you say I didn't see it. Uh, the the small little one that's posted at the in a common area where a pond, you know, no fishing, no trespassing, and it's a nice little decorative sign. And you know, the 15 year old didn't see it. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a tough sell on that one. So, who are turfing them? You got to call us right away. I've wrote and I've written that ticket before because you can get into thousands and thousands of dollars in damage, right? If you call a landscaper, it's gonna cost who knows what to get that all replaced. So. Um, a huge thing is is you got to call us when it happens, and the other one is the plate. I mean, we, we if without the plate on the car, and especially if you say you know it's a red car, okay, it's it's a red car. My lucky one years ago, I got the plate description of the car and where they were, and when I found that kind of car, they were smart or not smart. If it was really wet and all the grass and stuff was all up in there, um, it was off of Livernois and Green. I think it was Green Spring, and I happened to come across the people that that did it. So. You could put cameras out, but again, if the camera's not going to get the plate of the car and you tell me it's a, a red four-door sedan, man, there's a lot of red four-door sedans in Rochester Hills. Um, so, And cameras are great things. If you didn't know, you're on camera every time you move in Rochester Hills. Um, every store, every restaurant, every intersection, um, all of them are all recorded. But if you, do, if you can't get that plate, it just doesn't, uh, you know, people, I got video. That's great. And it's all grainy and it looks kind of, you know, I'm not knocking anybody's video system, but if you spent... Forty-five dollars on Amazon for it, you know. You got to spend, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars on a nice, nice system um, to get good to get good footage. But plates are are huge. I'd love to have every one of my entrances. I'd love to have a, a camera down below, right, and it records the plate coming in and out like a like a plate reader. Um, but I, I would never put it up down. I put it down low. But I don't think our HL ever. I finally got street lights. If you didn't hear about that one. We talked about that a couple of years ago. We got 50 street lights in my neighborhood. Uh, I love it. Other people. Do. The local uh, city just uh, start enforcing the excessive noise uh, ordinance. Where they're going to start ticketing now with the equipment. Or? Well, I don't know. We've always had excessive noise. Yeah, it's I you know it's it's. It can, it can be an excessive noise. It can't be disturbing the peace because my peace can't be disturbed. As a law enforcement officer, you can't be disturbed. Others can. But it's like the, someone I was talking the other day. I was talking at the at a thing with uh, with Chief over there. No, he's still hanging out. Um, where it said the cell phones on your phone, right? Troy came up with this thing calling on your cell phone. Well, that's always been an infraction. The infraction of motor vehicle code is driving without due care and caution. Well, if you're on your phone, that's driving without due care and caution. Dog in your lap, eating a hamburger. They're all due, without due care and caution. Troy just jumped on board and said, okay, we'll make it a specific infraction. But Excessive noise, I guess that's a judgment call. So It is, it, yeah. It used to be a common ticket. For sex, yeah, you put a you know cherry bond muffler on a car or something like that. So, without a doubt, something. So, for building there is, but not for, not for like playing ball. Like if I'm out there playing basketball at three o'clock in the morning, I can disturb the peace if a neighbor calls. But I, I as a police officer can't show up. Like I said, my peace can't be disturbed. You'd have to be the complainant, and then no one ever wants to. Be. And my. 26 years now, I say, okay, well, are you willing to be the complaint on it? Well, you know, I just wanted the noise to stop. I really didn't. I'm like, okay, well, I can't, you know, it, it, it's kind of tricky. Or they refuse complaint because they don't want the neighbors to know they're the ones that called, that showed up, that, that it occurred. Uh, but it's building. Is any building still in here? I'm pretty sure it's seven because Oakland Township was eight, and here it's seven. This is the dumpsters, right? Dumpster guys can't dump at 5 o'clock in the morning for that for that reason, so. Yes, ma'am. So I'll come right to your house and do like a security site survey. Um, uh, you know, I'll do doors, locks, windows, um, bushes. It's called, uh, it's, it's not, it's, uh, how do I say it? It's, it's like environmental through, it's a, it's a, how do we, I'm trying to think of an acronym, but it's like an environmental mechanical approach on how you, how you look at things and how you do your doors, windows, locks, lighting, illumination, things like that. And I'll come to your, I'll come to anybody's house and walk around. And it's like I do a dev presentation. You get a you get a, a, a door lock. You go to Home Depot. Um, don't spend three dollars. Spend you know, I don't know, hundred something dollars. Uh, if you get a Quick Set or a Home Depot brand, uh, you're getting Quick Set Home Depot as well as a slag or something like that. <clears throat> and then you get this this deadbolt, and the deadbolt is I don't know, you know, like this thick and goes in that far, and that's your deadbolt. That's not your deadbolt at all. Your deadbolt is that little screw that goes into your door, which then goes into a door frame. 
So I've talked about the last one. Has anybody ever put a door in before? There's a door frame. The door frame's only like that, right? I mean, so you got to take your little bitty screw out, take it out of the door frame, and put it into the to frame of the house. And now, now you have that. And how I got extensive use on that or extensive education is for 17 years on the SWAT team, I'm the guy that broke the door down. So I had ran out there in my black pajamas at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd hit that door, and then when I got done, I'd go back and look, how did I do? And then some, like Home Depot and things like that, or door people, started putting metal, like a metal uh, bracket or a frame, so it went through the metal, and then into the door, so it was harder to get into. So, that, yeah, I'll come, I'll come to anybody's house, so. Not a I'll come to your association meetings or all that stuff. I have no problems coming to any meetings. So. If what? I am not retiring. Um, three, like I said, three months away from 25 years. Uh, but we do not have pensions and uh, certain things in the in the world today. I mean, I'm not getting a bomb dropped on me, so life's good, right? Uh, but the stock market's not doing that well right now. So um, I'm good for another five. The dog will be around um, at least. And we'll go from there. Yeah, I'll be around for a while. And I'm staying in Rochester Hills. Like I said, I live and work here. Uh, sometimes it shoots yourself in the foot by living and working here. Uh, but it, it hasn't been that too bad. So I'll stick with it. Anything else? Nothing? Last, we'll see what we've done by 1130. That's pretty good. I like that. Good deal. Thanks, Mark. Up next, we have the building department. We have Deputy Director Tim Hollis. Well, good evening, everyone. We're in the wind down, I think. So thank you for uh, sticking with us. Uh, I wanted to share some things with you tonight. Um, my name is Tim Hollis. I'm the deputy director of the building department. It's actually called Building Ordinance and Facilities. We have three divisions in our department. So you know what building is. You know what ordinance is. And you probably go, what is facilities? Well, it doesn't really involve you folks, but yet it does because our facilities team is what we call the unsung heroes. You don't see them, but they are, they are working in all the city buildings all day long, even in the evenings, cleaning and maintaining uh, the over 30 city properties that we have. So we have uh, a team of about uh, 10 guys that uh, do that all day long and, and during the night. We have a guy here tonight on second shift that he won't leave until after we do. So. Um, they're very important to us, and they've worked very hard through COVID. They they clean the buildings and they fumigate them and everything for all the COVID stuff. So we're very safe, and we're very fortunate to have them. Uh, I've been in the building department uh, will be 20 years on May 20th, and I am not retiring. Uh, at least I haven't been told I am yet, but you never know. So I have a ways to go before that'll happen. But uh, glad to uh, serve, and all those years have been in the building department. And for 17 years, 17 years before that, I was in construction, including my own business, for uh, about eight years before I came here. So um, know a lot about residential construction, learned a lot about commercial construction, as we, as we have. So we're going to give, uh, first of all, we're going to do a uh, construction update here. I wanted to uh, give you a little comparison from last year to this year. Last year was a banner year for us. Um, even with all the COVID stuff going on, we saw a record number of uh, new house permits and even commercial permits all across the board. Trade permits, you name it. Um, we broke all kinds of records. Um, this year, we're not far off that pace. You see last year we had at this, in the first quarter, we had 32 new house permits. We're already at 28. So we're, we're on track to uh, possibly uh, tie that or go ahead of that record this year. There's a lot of things coming our, coming our way. You go around town, you can see all kinds of construction happening. So what are some uh, building projects that are kind of big hot going right now? Well, Rochester Hills Trio, that's at the corner of Livernois and Auburn. There's two buildings up right now. Third one uh, hasn't started to come up out of the ground yet, but uh, that project is going to be a while yet, but it is moving forward. Um, then uh, Legacy, now this is next to Innovation Hills, they're in Hamlin. Uh, we had a meeting with them the other day and they tell us that their first building they plan to have occupancy by July. So that first building that's there, we'll see. And uh, they're hoping to actually wrap that project up by the beginning of next year. They got a long ways to go. I think our Michigan winter 
hit them a little unexpected. They're southern builders, and they didn't really uh, expect all that the weather gave them. Uh, and they, they, like everyone else, have been experiencing uh, staff shortages, you know, trade shortages, so forth. So there's a lot of that out there. Redwood, this is over by Yates Starter Mill. So the foundations have started going for this. This is, uh, these are apartments. They are rented. They are um, single story uh, townhomes, actually. So they're, they're like individual houses, but they're stacked together and there's, uh, Buildings, I think we have from three to six units uh, buildings out there. So they've started their foundations out there. You probably have trouble getting there to see it because, as we all know, DeQuinder and Avon is closed. And so the only way you can get there is going up DeQuinder and then you got a U turn and come back. So um, hopefully, and the, and the road construction, all that kind of coordinates with this whole project. So that's going on. Uh, Ocean Inn. Everybody know where that is? Well, they're moving. They aren't leaving, but they're moving. So they are relocating to the old Panera site up here on Livernoy. Panera moved out there in the new building, and they are planning, they have plans in right now that we're reviewing. And if all goes well, they're going to move into the old Panera space. And uh, the owner is very excited about that new location. And uh, on Livernoy at Walton, on the northeast corner by Kroger's. So um, I just uh, found out from Councilman Walker he had to leave, but he shared with me that the new Ace Hardware on Walton, on the north, north of uh, Rochester High School, is having their ribbon cutting tomorrow at 4 p.m. So uh, they may already be open, but their official ribbon cutting is tomorrow. So I'm hoping to attend that as well. We like to go out on some of those new businesses and welcome them at their grand opening. Um, all right, so how many of you know that May is National Building Safety Month? Yes, May is National Building Safety Month. Uh, we are members of the International Code Council, and they started something many years ago called Building Safety Month, and May is that month. Uh, we have some events that we are coordinating with some of our, our businesses. Um, on May 7th, we'll be at Home Depot work with their kids' workshop. See a picture of it here. And we... Uh, kind of do like we do tonight. We're not, we don't stand up and speak, but we hand out information and we have these plastic hard hats we give the kids with our logo on them and we give them little green stickers for their little projects they build, approval stickers and so forth, and try to promote building safety. We'll be doing that um, May 7th at Home Depot, May 11th at the OPC. We'll be there from 9 to 11, and then May 21st uh, at Lowe's from 9 to noon. And so in cooperation with our local businesses, we go out and promote building safety. Now, building safety doesn't just happen in May, though, right? The reason we're here, our department is all about safety, um, whether it's ordinance and keeping things clean and, and you know, uh, beautiful or building, make sure that people are building safely. Um, and what we ask of you as homeowner association leaders is to help us because there are things that um, you need to know that, that can help you with your residents. Now, we cannot enforce your local bylaws for your associations. You might have uh, bylaws that prohibit fences or other things, uh, sheds or whatever. The city doesn't prohibit that and the code doesn't prohibit it, but you certainly can. So your, your bylaws can supersede what the codes are. <clears throat> but if someone comes in and asks for a building permit, <clears throat> I can grant them a building permit, but hopefully they've gone and talked to you first. So I encourage you, some associations they have in their bylaws or arrangements that homeowners have to come to them first before they can apply for a project. We don't know whether they've done that or not. One of the things I will share with you, though, is that um, we always get a lot of questions about uh, sheds or detached accessory structures. And so... Um, Detached accessory structures, to truly be detached from a house, considered detached, uh, you have to be 10 feet away from the main house, okay? What you get is you get a break as to how close you can be to a property line. So normally, we have uh, four zoning, approximately four, four or five zoning districts here in, in Rochester Hills. And some of them, you can be as close as 10 feet to the property line with your main structure, some you have to be 15. The R1s and R2s are 15-foot side yard, and uh, 
the R3s and R4s typically are 10 feet. Um, rear yard is always 35 feet unless you abut an open space or a park that's at least 100 feet across, then you get a reduction down to 30 feet. If you, want, if you have any questions on that, just call us. But we also have on our website guidebooks for like new home construction, accessory structure construction, um, and it has some of these guidelines in there. So if you know what your zoning district is, you can find what those setback requirements are. If you don't, give us a call and we can tell you what the zoning is. But if the, if the accessory structure is detached from the house, it's 10 feet away, then you get reductions in how close you can be to those property lines. So um, a detached accessory structure can be as close as five feet to a side yard or rear yard property line, provided there's no um, easements. You can never build in an easement. If it's a city owned easement, you can never build in it. So if it's Typically, you got a sanitary structure running underneath it. The city maintains those. You can't build in that. Um, if it's a private easement, then the, you, the, we tell the uh, applicant, you have to go to that easement owner, which sometimes is the HOAs, and get their approval and bring us a letter from them saying you can build in that. So I've seen some of those letters worded in such a way that, okay, we're going to let you build in there, but if we ever, the HOA says, if we ever have to do anything in that easement, we're not responsible. We have to tear your shed down or whatever. It's in there, a fence or whatever. We're not responsible to put it back. So you can word that however you want, but that's how we, that's the one thing we do ask is, is if they want to build in an easement, you got to get approval from that HOA or whoever owns that easement and bring us that letter from their leadership. Um, but uh, if that accessory structure is uh, 200 square feet or less, um, by state law, a building permit is not required. So a shed, a small shed or structure like that that's under 200 square feet, it's a detached from the house, it's 10 feet away, it doesn't need a permit, but you still have to meet all the zoning requirements, all the setbacks, okay, um, per the ordinances. So any questions on that, just give us a call and we can walk you through it. Just wanted to touch on that because we get a lot of questions about, hey, can I build a shed, do I need a permit, and so forth. So. You don't always. Now, if you're going to attach it to something else, there are limits on how much accessory structure you can have depending on the size of your lot. So it's not like you can just build a huge thing. Um, there are limits square footage wise, and you can never exceed with all of your garage and your shed and anything that's considered accessory, you can never exceed the square footage of your house. Because now you're not principal residence, you're principal accessory. All right? So. There's a couple caveats to that. You can't just go build anything you want. Um, you gotta maintain the square footage limits. All right, so along with the Building Safety Month in May, we are once again doing our free deck inspections. And we have a couple things on the table back there. This is a, this is kind of a cumbersome book unless you're building a deck. And, uh, but we put this together to help people because actually decks um, are not, there's not a whole lot of information in the code on how to build them because they're considered what they call post beam construction. There's posts and there's beams and the code doesn't get very detailed in that. So this guidebook was put together to assist deck builders and homeowners on, so you don't have to go get an engineer because technically anything that's outside of the scope of the written code, you need an engineer to design it. But we've had uh, this booklet put together by um, overseen by an engineer to put span tables and things in there that you can use to build a deck. So this is back there. But the free deck inspections, we have a, um, where's my, we have a offering to you and any of your members, any of our residents, to get their existing deck inspected for free uh, in the month, uh, uh, you need to call us in the month of May before June 1st to get on our list. We will come out during the summer, typically June, July, and, and do the inspection. And then um, if there's a permit needed for the repair, you need to obtain the permit by October 1st. Now, anyone that gets this free deck inspection is not required to do anything. We're coming out, you know, last thing you want is the government in your backyard telling you what to do, right? So we're coming out as a free service to say, we want your deck to be safe. And we're going we're gonna to point out some things to the homeowners and say, 
you know, you got some rusted bolts. You need to take some of these, maybe take one out and look at it because if you see rust on the surface of a bolt, that wood stays damp inside. And we've seen bolts pulled out where they go from a half inch down to about eighth inch and then they get big again as it comes back out. They, they rust right off in the middle. So unless you take one of those out, you don't really know what you got. Our inspectors will come out and they will do a free inspection and just give some advice. They have a checklist and we have these back there too. If you want to take it yourself and do your own uh, deck inspection, you can. Um, there's no obligation. If the inspector comes out and says, hey, there's some things you need to do, that's just left to the homeowner whether they want to do it or not. We're not there to say, okay, you've had us here, now you got to do it. And if, it, if you're going to replace like a railing or something structural that needs a permit, those who get the deck inspection during this uh, period of time during the summer, they sign up by the end of May, they get the inspection, and they decide, okay, I'm going to do the repairs, I need a permit, the permit is free. So there's not a cost, and the inspections are free for the repair. Matter of fact, I don't think we have it back there tonight, but if you contact us, we have we can give you a list of deck contractors that have done work here in the city. Now, we can't recommend anybody or whatever. You've got to do your own due diligence to vet them whether you think they're good or not, but we can tell you who has done work here in the city if you need deck contractors. We have a list of that. So that is uh, part of our Building Safety Month. We also, our, our inspectors, We'll be going in May um, to a disaster preparedness training. We do this annually, and uh, we go out and we, they mock up buildings and we assess them based on, they say, okay, this building's been hit by a tornado and this is what's happened and all that. How many of you remember the tornado that hit Rochester Hills probably about five years ago? Okay, up off Grandview. So I was called, I got a call on Sunday morning at about 7, 8, 8 a.m., something like that, that we had to report. And that was our, we had been through some training and that was our real scenario. And we walked the streets, I, there was, got in groups and we had lists that we had to go through and identify all the damage um, for that. Those are important things because in order to, for the city to get help if needed, depending on the amount of damage, whether it comes from the county, the state, FEMA or whatever, uh, which eventually might roll over to the, neighbor, to the residents, doesn't always, but for the city to rebuild, that those assessments have to be done in a very timely manner, within just like a couple days. You got a certain number of hours to get things um, reported. So we did that. So we'll be doing this disaster preparedness training. That's part of what we do. All right, uh, I think I've covered my stuff mainly. Anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. You're only allowed one. No. The two, so anything under 200 square feet, because it doesn't require a permit, there's really there's nothing that says what you have to do to build it, what, what kind of a foundation you have to have. But, but, but the code exempts anything under 200, so it, it, it really is, doesn't need a permit, therefore we don't, there's, we don't, we can't regulate what kind of footings people put in, right? If they, if they want to have a permit and have it inspected, we certainly will do that. I tell people that all the time. Sometimes you get stuff in and we go, well, this doesn't need a permit, and, but if they want a permit and they want an inspection, we'll do it. Um, you know, some people, they want to they wanna put in footings, they want to put in a patio, and they want to put in footings because maybe down the road they want to build a building on it. Well, we want to inspect that now because we're prepared. We can document that. Okay, these footings are there, so when they want to put that other structure on top of it later, we don't have to dig things up and see what they had done without us. So, yes. So there, there's a lot of different, and you can look at our deck guide or guides online for different structures, but there are different inspections depending on type of structure. Um, in the end, you can go on the website, say's website, mm -hmm. and you can, uh, Beth, Beth, correct me if I'm wrong, but they can go to an address and put in an address, any address, and see if somebody got a permit. 
That's out there. So okay. You can see, if you see someone building something in your neighborhood, you want to see, did they get a permit? You go to the city's website, you can, there's a place where you can put in permit and data, property data lookup, and go to a building department, and you can type in, you know, type in the address, and you can see what permits they have. The Rochester Hills website? Okay. Yep, and you can also be able to see which inspections they had. The last inspection is called a final. So if a final inspection has been always complete. a final. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that. And then the other one is, um, like in our subdivision, we don't allow above ground pools, but maybe some people throughout the years have gotten a hot tub in their backyard, nobody notices. Is there a policy in Rochester Hills regarding above ground pools? Are they allowed, or are they not allowed? Or Yeah, so Rochester Hills follows the state of Michigan construction code. We don't have our own codes. We have our own ordinances that says where things can be, how close they can be, but we don't have uh, our own codes. The whole state's supposed to follow the state construction code. The, the state code allows above ground pools, and a lot of people, I'm glad you brought this up because it's coming out in our Hills Herald article. One of our articles talks about pool safety. Any pool that hold, is over 24, holds over 24 inches deep of water requires a permit. So these blow up pools that people buy and stick them in their yard, they require a permit. And most of the time they might require a fence because some of them, their walls are made so that you can almost climb them. So um, the pool wall has to be at least 48 inches high all the way around. No grade can be up against it that makes it less than that before, in order for you not to have a, a code required fence. So the, the wall of the pool can be the barrier you have to have a ladder that either can be locked, secured, or removed in order to not have a separate fence around it. But these portable pools are a big concern to us because we see them pop up all over the place. People buy them at Walmart, Home Depot, or wherever, pool places, and think they don't need a permit. But the code says over 24 inches of water needs a building permit. And it may need an electrical permit because sometimes you can't run, you, you can never run them on an extension cord. Now they're making some of the pumps with longer cords if they're smaller pools, but you know, they have to be plugged into a GFI and there's a lot of other things. So if you're running any electrical to it to supplement that, that requires electrical permit along with it. So we could look to see, say well, somebody's putting a deck and a hot tub in, there might be a final inspection on the deck and there'd be a final inspection on the hot tub or pool after it passed the electrical and the other, maybe a, a concrete slab underneath it or some of the other rules that were associated with it. Right, it? Okay. and um, we do have a pool construction guidebook for above ground and in ground on our website as well. Okay. Yeah, and it gives you some of that um, guideline. And, and one thing about hot tubs is they are considered a pool. So um, they, they follow some of the same rules. They need, they need a permit. And the one thing that hot tips had the exception of is there is a code approved locking cover that if you have that for your hot tub, uh, you don't need a fence or another barrier because they're shorter than four feet, most of them, right? So you gotta have that barrier or the locking cover. And that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we do the permit for them because we wanna make sure that they have the proper cover. Now, it's the homeowner's responsibility to make sure they get the cover on, right? They're not automatic. And a lot of people don't know this either, and I just want to mention this, you brought this to mind. Uh, in ground pools, you may see some without fences, and they are state approved if they have what's called an automatic cover. There's an automatic cover that covers the pool. Again, a lot of people don't like them. They're like, why doesn't that pool have a fence? Because they have that exception for an automatic cover, and it's a kind that a baby elephant can walk on and you don't fall in the water. However, it is the homeowner's responsibility to make sure who closes the cover. They do, right? It doesn't close every time you get out of the pool, you have to close it. So there is, you know, the codes are designed to, to provide safety, but we can only do so much. There's responsibility on, on the owners to take care of things as well. Yeah, yeah so, we're very concerned. Wood decks, a lot of people don't realize this. Typically after about 10 years, you need to maintenance your deck somehow. And I'm not just talking about staining it. There's probably some things you're gonna need to, uh, to replace or uh, repair. 
So, um, you know, there's thousands of, there's videos online. You can see, actually see people have captured deck failures, railing failures, people have been injured or even worse. So we have, we have tens of thousands of wooden decks here in Rochester Hills, and that is a big concern to us. So, but the, the, the problem we have is we can't go on the property without the owner's approval. We can go to the door and we can say, hey, like for instance, somebody can call and file a, a complaint with us, a building complaint. It can be anonymous. You just talk to one of our customer service staff, they can enter that complaint. We can send an inspector or an ordinance inspector out to look at it, but we can't go on the property. You can't go in their backyard. If we can see it from the street, it's kind of tough for most decks, but um, we can't go in their backyard without their permission. But we can go to the door and say, there's been a concern. Do you mind if we take a look and we might be able to help you with this? Yeah, but we, we certainly would, would like to do that. Anything else before Jody takes over? Yeah. We all want to believe that every contractor out there does the right thing, but we've seen a lot of things wired wrong or, you know, installed wrong. And we, we want the homeowners not only to get what they're paying for, but we want them to be safe. You know, new, new furnaces being put in, new water heaters being put in. Those all are, you know, you don't want to have carbon monoxide in your house because somebody didn't connect a vent properly. Um, we do, we do, they're, they're relatively inexpensive permits for those. Um, and we have an inspector, all of our inspectors are not only registered with the state, but we're ICC certified, International Code Council certified in what we're looking at. So we go through a lot of testing and training to make sure we have the, the people that know what they're looking at, and that's for the safety of the residents. Okay, all right, Jody, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Now last up, we have uh, Ordinance Inspector Matt Wells. Um, Matt took over, as most of you probably know, we had a big turnover in the Ordinance Division in the last year where we had a big retirement, everybody retired. So if any of you used to deal with Mark McLaughlin, Matt has now taken over Mark's area, so you'll be able to contact Matt. Good evening, um, I'm the new guy. <laughs> um, just a few things I'm gonna to touch on. I was, uh, I was on the board of my association. I live up in Oxford, but I understand a lot of the questions that the board members come up with. So these are just a few things I'll touch on. We'll get be quick and I'll be done. So um, grass and landscaping is usually an issue. Everyone talks about uh, so-and-so's yards never cut, whatever else. Um, according to the ordinance, you need to cut your grass on a regular maintenance. Um, just keep it, keep it cut. It's the biggest thing. There's no, there's no set, set height that you need to be. If we, if I'm driving around and, and someone says, "Hey, their grass is over eight inches," we've got a problem. The city can send someone out to um, have the grass cut, and it'll be cut at the owner's expense. Um, other than that, maintain the yards. Um, you probably saw this graphic earlier um, with forestry. This is for our pathways. We've got lots of pathways, sidewalks. Um, if you have property that butts up to any of these things in your backyard, the front yard, wherever it is, um, you are responsible for it. I don't know if sometimes the HOAs take care of it for the individual owner, but um, they are responsible to maintain these areas. You have to keep one foot away from the, from the base of the pathway, from your brush and it needs to be maintained eight foot of clearance for headway. Pretty simple. Uh, we do have a, uh, one of our ordinance officers will be driving around all summer long and that's what he does, he checks them. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Trailers and campers, boats, those are issues that everyone, I don't wanna look at so-and-so's trailer, so-and-so's campers in their front yard all the time. Happens, I know I dealt with it. Um, you are allowed to have those on your property. They need to be stored either in the side or the rear of the house if you're going to store it there. And they need to be um, on setbacks from your property lines as well. They need to be maintained and in, in, in good working condition. You can't put Cousin Eddie's tenement on wheels in your backyard. Um, you are allowed to bring the camper or boat, um, your recreational vehicle out front for up to 72 hours before or after. Um, you plan on using it to load it, wash it, clean it, maintenance, what like that. But they can't be stored out in the yard, they can't be stored in the front yard, they can't be stored out in the street. 
Um, grass watering. Um, pretty simple. You can water any, any time between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. During the day, it's um, is a no-no. Um, if you have to water for emergencies, um, so be it. We'll figure it out. But um, those are the times that you're supposed to be watering. It's between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. And lastly, if you have an HOA, um, part of the or as the ordinance people, we we're happy to round, be around, and be available to answer questions. And we'd love to attend your meetings if you'd like us to be there. Um, you can call the building department, and we'll be happy to uh, set up a time and work it out and, and be at your meetings. We would love to be there and be available for answering questions or anything we can help. Okay, watering from the pond is different than watering from the city system. Um, that's a good question, and I can get the answer for you. <laughs> Are there any questions other than that? Yeah, I do, I do have a question over here. Yes. Um, a couple of years ago, actually before COVID, there was an effort to go through and get all of the houses set up with backflow um, connectors. Yep. Um, I know in our subdivision, we did not get a lot of them taken care of. Is that still going on or has that been discontinued? Do you know? That, that would be a question for DPS. Yes, sorry. Okay. There you go. Anyone else have any questions for ordinance? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Matt. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Again, if you didn't grab any information from the back of the room, please grab some. All of our business cards are back there. We're happy to answer any questions you have about anything at any time. If you email one of us and it's not the question for us, we will get that question to the right person for you. Otherwise, have a great night. Thank you.